drugs of abuse. Where do you work? So uh, my most recent employment was with the Baylor College of Medicine uh, and uh, the University of Texas uh, MD Anderson Cancer Center, which is in Houston, Texas. So to start out, can you explain what an addiction neuropharmacologist is? So obviously the first word is addiction, and so I study addiction in various forms. Uh, and a neuropharmacologist basically is two different things. One, a neuroscientist uh, and someone who studies pharmacology. Uh, a neuroscientist is someone who studies the brain specifically, um, how the brain works, how it functions, how it responds to stimuli in the environment. And then a pharmacologist is someone who is interested in how drugs interact in the brain, but also in the body in general. So it's a combination of those two, specifically looking at the pharmacology within the brain. What type of addiction do you study? So I've studied across the board all of the different uh, drugs of, of abuse, and that includes opioids, cocaine, methamphetamine, alcohol, nicotine, ecstasy. It, it, it goes on and on. So you may have touched on this a little bit, but how does the specialty of neuropharmacology relate to addiction? Well, it's just it's a matter of knowing uh, what impact that drugs of abuse can have on the brain, both acutely uh, in the very short term as well as long term or chronically. So why focus on the brain? Well, that's basically what, ha you know, the, all of these drugs cross the blood-brain barrier and then they have effects on the brain. The question becomes, you know, are those effects acute, short term, or are they long term? And do they change the brain in any way that's meaningful? And is that at least part of the focus of the studies that you've done over the years? Yes, very much. So let me ask you, how does one become an addiction neuropharmacologist? Well, there are several different ways one can uh, end up at, at this point. Um, my particular path was uh, a, a general interest in neuroscience. My master's degree was at the University of North Texas, which is in Denton, just south of Oklahoma. And uh, so my interest was in neuroscience at that time, but then when I went on to do my uh, doctorate work, I uh, landed in a lab that did pharmacology work. And so that's where the intersection between neuroscience and pharmacology occurred. Uh, and, and in that particular lab, uh, they were doing cocaine research, so it was immediately addiction neuropharmacology. So let's break that down a little bit and talk more specifically about your education. Uh, where did you obtain your undergraduate degree? So it was uh, Texas A&M University in East Texas, which is in commerce, uh, and that was a bachelor's of science degree, and that was in 1985. Where did you grow up? So I grew up in Dallas. It's uh, in North Texas. So what did you do then after you obtained your degree at Texas A&M? So I uh, then went to the University of North Texas, which is in Denton, uh, and then I received a master's of science degree uh, in biology and with an emphasis in neuroscience. So what did you do after that? Uh, then I went to the uh, University of Texas medical branch, uh, and that's in Galveston, and that was from 1991 to 1996. Is that where you obtained your PhD? That's correct. So what was the focus of your study during your PhD work? So we were interested in uh, looking at one specific neurotransmitter system in the brain, and it's called serotonin, uh, S-E-R-O-T-O-N-I-N. -E and as many of you may know, there are multiple neurotransmitter systems in the brain. Serotonin is one of them. Dopamine is another, opioids, etc. And so the uh, intent that we had was to evaluate uh, two specific receptor subtypes for serotonin. Uh, 5-HT1A receptors and 5-HT3 receptors. Did you say 5-H? Uh-huh, 5-HT. That's a, an abbreviation for serotonin, 5-hydroxytryptophan. I don't know that we need to get that uh, detailed, but it's basically a way of, of uh, abbreviating uh, the compound uh, name. But 5-HT1A and 5-HT3 receptors uh, are among several uh, receptor subtypes for serotonin, and we wanted to know just what uh, impact it had on the effects produced by cocaine. And uh, so that's what the, the, the dissertation was about. So a lot of terminology there. So we'll go slow, and from okay. time to time, we'll probably have you spell okay. some of those terms. Uh, but uh, let me just ask about a couple of them that you mentioned there, OK? OK. Just so we have a framework. Neurotransmitters. OK. What are we talking about? 
Well, the neurotransmitters, and I alluded to this, is, are, 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 are those that are present in the brain. And so you have different types. There's dopamine, there's norepinephrine, there's serotonin, there's glutamate, there's GABA. There are multiple neurotransmitters uh, systems in the brain, and, and these are released as a function of stimuli uh, in the environment or, and or as a response to drugs that are ingested. You also mentioned receptors. Right. What are we talking about there? Okay, so receptors essentially uh, exist on neurons in the brain, and uh, a neurotransmitter can bind to a receptor and then produce uh, effect, an effect. So dopamine can bind, dopamine can bind to a, a dopamine receptor and then produce an effect or a drug that uh, has affinity for that receptor can bind to that receptor and produce an effect. So when we're studying addiction, why do neurotransmitters and receptors matter? Well, it matters because these compounds um, are different in the way that they target different neurotransmitter systems in the brain, uh, basically. Uh, they have different what's called affinity, H-A-F-F-I-N. -A -A I T Y. That was very good. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, so that's one part of it. Uh, but understanding how uh, those drugs have uh, effects on the overall brain is also important. Now, was the research that you were doing as part of your PhD work, did that focus on humans? Uh, no, that was in uh, ro rodents. Why rodents? Uh, rodents? Rodents, R O D E N T S, or rats. So why rodents? So rodents serve as uh, an animal model uh, for addiction. Um, rodents are used uh, across the board for all uh, health conditions that are being, uh, when, when uh, uh, companies and or individual investigators want to evaluate a particular compound or try to understand uh, how the brain functions, they often start first in rodents or in non-human primates. They use animal models. Uh, to uh, s start the process of understanding whether or not uh, a compound is going to have some effect. And does studying rodents then give you valuable information in terms of what the effect might be on humans? Oh yes, absolutely. So did your dissertation work touch upon opioids in any way? Yes, I mean at the time we knew uh, very specifically that cocaine, uh, and that was a, the primary target of, of the investigation, we know that uh, individuals who use cocaine also use other drugs. And some of those other drugs, for example, uh, are opioids. And so we knew that we had to take that into consideration. Not only that, we know that in the brain, uh, one of the primary targets for cocaine is the dopamine system. And we know that there are interactions between dopamine and opioid systems in the brain. And so for that reason, we were um, fully aware of the need to understand that interaction between those two neurotransmitter systems. Okay. When you're talking about a system, you're talking about the neurotransmitter system that you described a bit earlier. Yes, that's correct. And similar system at issue with cocaine and opioids. That's correct. And other drugs of abuse? Certainly. So when did you obtain your PhD? Uh, 1996. What did you do next? So I, I did a, a postdoctoral fellowship uh, at Harvard Medical School. That's in Boston. And what was the emphasis of your research during your postdoctoral fellowship at Harvard? So it was neurochemistry. So how does neurochemistry differ if it does from neurobiology? Well, so, so neurobiology in general is understanding the brain and how the brain is laid out and what brain areas are important. Neurochemistry is trying to understand what is occurring at the individual level of the cell or the neuron? Uh, how, does, how, how do those neurons change or differ as a function of exposure to stimuli that could be either pleasurable events or a drug itself, how it changes the chemistry? So how long were you at Harvard? Uh, three years. So can you describe some of the work that you did during your time at Harvard? We did a, a lot of work uh, while I was there. One, uh, one particular project uh, that comes to mind was a uh, auto, I'm afraid to, to give you too many uh, big terms, but an auto radiographic uh, study, and that's A U T O R A D I O G R A P H I C. Uh, 
Using autoradiography, we were able to delineate for the first time the distribution of dopamine D4 receptors. Um, that's one specific receptor subtype in the brain. For each of the major neurotransmitters uh, in the brain, there are separate targets and or receptors. Um, for dopamine, there are five uh, different receptors, D1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Makes it pretty easy. We were evaluating for the first time, what is the distribution of D4 receptors in the brain? And so we provided the first map ever uh, of the localization of where they're located in the brain, and it happens to be highly located to the frontal cortex. So just to be clear, what do you mean when you say you mapped it? Well, that, we use that specific technique, the autoradiography, to determine the, loca the location of those receptors in the brain. And did this uh, relate at all to uh, inhibitory control? Well, that's what the frontal cortex is all about. Okay, we will come back to that later in the examination. But was this uh, work published? Yes. And where and when? So it was uh, published in the journal Synapse, uh, S-Y-N-A-P-S-E, in 1999. And we'll talk a little bit about this as well. Was this a study or article peer-reviewed? Uh, yes, it was. What does it mean to be peer-reviewed? Well, articles that are peer-reviewed are sent out uh, to a specific journal, and that journal has an editor. The editor then submits uh, or sends that, uh, that article out to three independent reviewers. Those reviewers then go through the article. They judge it for its scientific merit. They make a determination as to whether or not the methodology is sound and the results, if they make sense. And then the discussion, does it all tie together? Does it, uh, is it scientifically meritorious? So it's an independent review that it has to go through before it's published. That's correct. And we'll get to it as well. You've acted as a peer reviewer for various journals, correct? Yes, I have. So has this article that was published in Synapse uh, been cited by others? Yes, it has. So you were at Harvard for how long? Uh, three years. And where'd you go next? Uh, subsequently, I was at Yale University School of Medicine. Uh, and uh, that's, uh, I was also in the Department of Psychiatry there. And was that a, uh, another postdoctoral fellowship? Yes, sir. And what was the focus of the work you did in that fellowship? So it was also neurochemistry, but it also involved behavioral science. And so we did a number of experiments there. Um, one of the experiments that we did was looking specifically at reversal learning, which is a form of inhibitory control. And so this was in non-human primates. And the study that we did was to uh, evaluate what are the uh, effects of intermittent cocaine on reversal learning. And uh, the finding was basically that if, if uh, animals are exposed to intermittent cocaine, they have impairments in reversal learning. And so that shows that uh, a stimulant drug like that can produce impairments in uh, that function. So we asked with respect to rodents, what about non-human primates? Why study them? Well, non-human primates are a, a very close approximation to what humans are like. And so their behaviors are very complex. Uh, and so it's an opportunity for us to, to get a better snapshot as to whether or not the behaviors that we're looking at and or the, the neurochemistry that we're looking at uh, is similar to that what we would expect in humans. Was the work uh, that you did both at Harvard and at Yale focused on addiction? Yes, all of it. Now, uh, you had mentioned some work at Yale uh, involving whether the reversal learning in non-human primates when exposed to cocaine. Was there an article or study published as a result of that work? Yes. And where and when? So that was uh, neuropsychopharmacology. So it's neuro, psycho, and then pharmacology. Um, and that was in 2000. Okay. What period of time were you at Yale? Uh, so I was at Yale for one year uh, during the year, not, essentially right after Harvard, uh, and then for the subsequent year and into 2000. Was the article uh, that appeared in Neuropsychopharmacology uh, peer reviewed? Yes, it was. And has it been cited by others? Yes. Often? Uh, quite a bit. So, uh, what did you do then after the fellowship at Yale? 
So I was uh, recruited to join the faculty at the Albert Einstein College of Medicine that's in the Bronx uh, of New York. Uh, and I was an assistant professor on the tenure track there. Before you went to uh, Albert Einstein College of Medicine, did you do teaching while you were at Harvard and Yale? Yes, I did. What type of teaching did you do? So mostly I was teaching uh, graduate students and medical students, uh, individuals who were rotating through the lab, uh, teaching them various techniques specific to the research that we were, we were doing, but also about addiction in general. So when did you um, join the, the faculty at the Albert Einstein College of Medicine? Uh, in 2000. Now, I know we've all heard about Harvard and Yale. I'm not sure we know as much about the Albert Einstein College of Medicine. Uh, can you tell Judge Bachman a little bit about that? Well, it's a you know freestanding medical school in, in the Bronx. Uh, associated with it is uh, its teaching hospital, which is the Montefiore, as M O N T F I O R E, uh, the Montefiore Medical Center, uh, which is a, one of the, the nicer uh, and best hospitals in New York. What was your position there? So I was an assistant professor. In what departments? In the department of psychiatry but I also had a secondary appointment in the Department of Neuroscience. So how does one get an appointment, uh, either primary or secondary, as an assistant uh, professor in such departments? Well, for a primary appointment, one has to be basically recruited into that position. So positions are uh, made public, uh, there, there are advertisements that go out, and then one competes for that position. And so one gains that position, and you have a primary appointment in that department, and so mine was in psychiatry. And then because I was trained as a neuroscientist, I sought out a secondary appointment, and that secondary appointment was in neuroscience, the Department of Neuroscience. And so in order to do that, you meet with the chair of that department as well as, as its faculty, and you present a seminar, and you basically make an appeal to them to say, I have some interests uh, that I think align with the goals and uh, interest that you have in, in, in your department, I would like to join your faculty. So you audition? Basically. And what does that give you if you have a secondary appointment as well as a primary appointment? Well, it allows someone the opportunity to, to uh, mentor and to teach students that are in that other department. So not only in your primary department, but now in this secondary department. And it also facilitates interactions between you and the faculty in that other department. So you now have a, you know, a, an enhanced ability to interact with them, to write grants, to, to write manuscripts. So it's a collegial uh, sort of uh, interaction. So the departments there were psychiatry, behavioral sciences, and neuroscience. Well, it's actually psychiatry and behavioral sciences was the overall uh, department name. And then there was the Department of Neuroscience, which is separate. So how long were you uh, at the Albert Einstein College of Medicine? Uh, four years. Did you teach during that time then? I did. And what did you teach and who did you teach? Well, I taught uh, some of the same people, medical students, graduate students. We had residents and interns who were then rotating through my lab uh, at that time. Your main focus was research, however? Oh, yeah. And what type of research did you do during that time period? So, I was, uh, so this was m my first opportunity to establish my own laboratory. And so I uh, established one that was based upon uh, my training at that point. It was, so it was heavily focused on neurochemistry with some behavioral research. And the focus was addiction? Yes. Did you do uh, any type of, well, strike that. During that time period, were you uh, registered with the DEA to uh, handle scheduled substances? I was. Why did you need that? Well, because some of the experiments that we were doing involved the use of scheduled substances. So cocaine, uh, ecstasy, uh, and so schedule one, schedule two. And so I needed to be able to have uh, access to those drugs, to be able to purchase those drugs, and then to safely store them and then uh, distribute them when we were conducting the experiments. And did the uh, registration include uh, Full schedule two drugs, including opioids? Oh, yes. So, um, for how long did you have that registration of that license? Uh, approximately four years, almost the entire time I was at, at Einstein. And did you do um, clinical trials or clinical work during that period of time? No, not during that time, but it was 
during that time that I uh, made uh, my first uh, foray into uh, human research. And that was because I um, was in contact uh, with and became good friends with the director of the Anxiety and Depression Program at the Montefiore Medical Center. Uh, and so he was actually treating people with anxiety and depression and was interested in some of the same things that I was interested in uh, in rodents. And so it was my first opportunity to start to, to, to look at uh, how these uh, very same questions are, are being asked and answered at, at both levels. So um, can you give some examples then of some of the research work you did while you were at the Albert Einstein College of Medicine? We did quite a few things uh, there, and I'm going to have to spell some stuff out for you. Uh, but w one of them was looking at uh, an endotoxin, so E-N-D-O-T-O-X-I-N. And that endotoxin, I'm going to just say LPS. If someone wants clarification, I can do it. Uh, that endotoxin was LPS. And we know that it's a, a component of the uh, bacterial cell wall. If you give LPS to a rodent or a human, uh, it produces a flu-like syndrome or sickness-like behaviors in rodents. So anyone who has ever had uh, the flu knows kind of what the constellation of symptoms would be like. You don't feel good. It produces an increase in pro-inflammatory cytokines. Um, Why don't we stop there? What was that last term? Uh, pro-inflammatory cytokines, which is C-Y-T-O-K-I-N-E-S. So it produces these effects. That's well known. It's been well established. Everybody knows that. What I was interested in was whether or not it actually uh, alters reward. And there are, are ways to, you know, to measure reward in, in rodents with the ultimate long-term goal of understanding whether or not we could model uh, the effects that we see in cocaine. Well, if you give LPS to rodents, it reduces the reinforcing effects produced by simple reinforcers like sugar. And so we see that response. And so that's also known as an anhedonic response. A-N-H-E-D-O-N-I-C. And again, if you've ever had the flu, you know what it's like to feel anhedonic. You're just not motivated. You don't want to engage in anything, even if it's really quite pleasurable. And so that anhedonic response is really quite important. And that occurs uh, in, in, in animals when you do this stimulation with LPS. And what I was ho hoping to do was to evaluate um, that as a model for anhedonia that occurs in individuals who use uh, drugs for a, a long time, who also exhibit uh, that same symptom. Now you mentioned something there that's probably worth explaining, rewards. What did you mean by that? Well, so rewards can take on various uh, types. You know, it can be rewarding to us, uh, you know, to, to see our wives or husbands or to see our kids or to go on a long walk. I like to run. Some people play tennis. All of these things are rewarding and reinforcing and pleasurable to us. Uh, and individuals who use uh, stimulant drugs and or illicit drugs of various sorts, including opioids, you activate the dopamine system. And at some point, and I hope to be able to show it uh, a little bit later, uh, the reward system becomes dampened as a function of that exposure. And that exposure uh, then changes the brain in that way and so there's a dopamine dysfunction. That dopamine dysfunction uh, can be manifest as anhedonia. So we'll come back to that in more detail. Um, was this work uh, published? Yes. And where and when? So that was published in uh, Brain Research in 2004. And was that article peer reviewed? It was Behavioral Brain Research, I'm sorry. Uh, it yes, it was. And has it been cited by others? Yes. So uh, you said you were at uh, Albert Einstein College of Medicine for about four years? That's correct. What did you do next? So I was then recruited to uh, UCLA, which is the University of California, Los Angeles. Uh, and, and there I uh, obtained an appointment within the Department of Psychiatry. What was your position there? Uh, the title was Visiting Associate Research Scientist. And did your uh, work at UCLA continue to focus on addiction? Very much so. 
what was the nature of that work? Well, so it was at that point that I made a transition in my career from doing uh, animal work to fully doing human work. Uh, and so we were doing human clinical trials, uh, phase one uh, trials as well as phase two trials for various medications. Just stop you then. What's a phase one trial? Okay, so there is a, this FDA approval process that occurs for all uh, medications that are being evaluated for any uh, you know, condition, whether it's a neuropsychiatric condition or a medical condition. Anyone who has a medication and wants to get that approval must go through the FDA approval process, and that involves phase one studies, which can be separated up into phase 1A and 1B, phase two studies, phase three studies, etc. I spent most of my time doing research at the level of the phase 1B study and also doing some phase two studies. Did all of that relate to addiction? It did. Uh, did you also teach while you were at UCLA? Yes, I did. And what did you teach? So mostly addiction, and I contributed to uh, courses that were being taught in the medical school, medical school, but also in the graduate school. Did any of the work that you were doing at UCLA relate to opioids? Well, you know, in all of our studies, uh, I think it's important to note that when we're evaluating uh, someone to include them in our studies, we also evaluate whether or not they meet criteria for opioid use disorder. Why do you do that? Well simply because we know that people who uh, abuse various drugs also co-use other drugs like opioids. And so we evaluate not only do we do a self-report and ask them whether or not they're using these drugs and do a comprehensive drug use history on them, we also do the, uh, go through a, uh, a specific means by which we can evaluate their drug use disorder. And then we test their urine, and we know whether or not they've been exposed to opioids, cocaine, or any other drug. So fair to say that opioids have the same uh, effect on the brain as other drugs of potential abuse? No doubt about it. So can you uh, give the court an example of some of the specific research you did while at UCLA? So we did quite a bit of, uh, of research at UCLA. Um, one particular study uh, that we did was to evaluate the effects of, uh, of a, a specific compound, and the compound is named modafinil, M-O-D-A-F-I-N-I-L. Yeah. Uh, so modafinil is a, an F FDA approved treatment uh, for narcolepsy, people who have trouble with their sleep-wake cycle. and so. We knew that that compound exists. We know that it's safe. We know that it's effective for that particular indication. What we wanted to do was submit uh, an uh, IND application to the FDA and say, we want to evaluate modafinil for uh, cocaine dependence. And we want to know whether or not it would be effective as a treatment for cocaine dependence. And we also did it for methamphetamine dependence. And so we, the reason why we did that is we know something about the way that modafinil works. And the way that it works, uh, among other things, is it has direct effects on dopamine systems. And so we thought that it would be a good, uh, a, a, a potentially good treatment for either cocaine or for methamphetamine dependence. So were the, the patients that were involved in these studies actually taking cocaine as part of the study? Uh, so we exposed people to cocaine who are cocaine addicted, and we exposed people who are methamphetamine to methamphetamine. How do, you, uh, I mean, do you need approval to do that? Oh, yes, from the, from the IRB. Uh, so the Human uh, uh, Inve the Investigational Research Board for the uh, university approves all human research uh, studies. So very controlled. Very much. Okay. So was that work, did that work result in a published study? Yes. Uh, in what publication and when? So th that study th had several components. The, the one that I was referring to was published in Neuropharmacology. In what year? I th think that was in 2006. Was that peer reviewed? Yes. And has it been cited by others? Yes. have to ask, um, there's been another uh, expert witness in this case from UCLA, Dr. Timothy Fong. Huh. Do you know him? I do. How do you know Dr. Fong? So during the time that I was at UCLA, Dr. Fong was a psychiatry resident, uh, and he uh, spent a year doing a research rotation in our lab. How long were you at UCLA? I was there for four years. 
Uh, what did you do next? So subsequently, I was recruited to the Baylor College of Medicine, uh, which is in Houston, Texas. And what position did you obtain uh, with the Baylor College of Medicine? So I started there as an associate professor and then was ultimately promoted to professor uh, with tenure. And was that in a particular department? Yeah, so the primary appointment was in the Department of Psychiatry, and then I had secondary appointments in the uh, Departments of Neuroscience and Pharmacology. Process getting those appointments similar to what we talked about earlier? Very much. Did you, uh, was this a tenured position? Uh, it ultimately was a tenured position. When I arrived, it was a tenure track position. Did you obtain tenure? I did. When? Uh, that was approximately 2013. And probably all have a sense of it, but what does it mean to be tenured? Well, tenure is, is essentially the, the university or the medical school's highest um, uh, honor that they can endow for, for an individual faculty member. It basically means you can't be fired. Uh, you essentially have reached a, a level of achievement within your position that you, know, you, you cannot be fired in, unless it's for cause. So you basically get to decide if you stay or leave rather than the college. Yes. Absent some extraordinary circumstances. Right. So it's an honor to be tenured. Right? It is. Uh, did you continue to do research uh, while you were at the Baylor College of Medicine? Yes. And where was that research done? So, you know, uh, Baylor uh, College of Medicine, uh, its main teaching hospital is the VA Medical Center, uh, the Veterans Affairs Medical Center. And in Houston, it's the Michael E. DeBakey VA Medical Center. It's D-E-B-A-K-E-Y. And so that's the main teaching hospital, so that's where we had to conduct our research. Uh, the reason why we had to conduct our research there was, again, because of the type of research that we were doing. We were not only doing human research, and we were not only evaluating specific compounds to determine whether or not they were efficacious uh, for the indication that we were looking at, but we were also administering these stimulant drugs. And so we needed to be in a hospital uh, so that there were nurses, there were doctors, there's an ER on the first floor. Uh, so it was very safe for the patients uh, that we were looking at. Did you have a formal position at the VA Medical Center? Yeah, I was professor uh, in the research services line at the same time that you had the uh, position with Baylor College of Medicine? That's correct. And worked in both capacities? Yes. Um, are you still working uh, in those capacities? <laughs> well, I recently retired, um, I think about nine days ago. June 30th was my last day. I think congratulations. I don't know. I do like <laughs> to see what happens when folks retire because I'm getting to that point myself. So I uh, just within the last couple of weeks, right? Uh, yeah, uh, a week ago Sunday. Okay. Uh, are you still affiliated with the Baylor College of Medicine? I am. I have an adjunct appointment as professor within the Department of Pharmacology. So um, at the same time, uh, after you joined the Baylor College of Medicine, you mentioned you also had a position with uh, University of Texas MD Anderson? That's correct. And what position did you have there? So I was professor and director of research within the Department of Psychiatry. Uh, and then I had a secondary appointment within the Department of Behavioral Sciences. So uh, before we get to that, can you describe the nature of the research you did uh, while you were with Baylor College of Medicine? So the research I did at Baylor was basically the same that I had been doing at UCLA. So it was human research, and it was specifically uh, for addiction and specifically doing clinical trials in humans. The type of trials that you had mentioned before? That's correct. But on humans at this point? Yes. Okay. And did you, uh, during that time, personally conduct any studies that specifically related to opioid addiction? Yes. I mean, some of the most recent work that I've done was on opioids. Can you describe that, please, for the court? Sure. So towards the, the end of my time there at Baylor, we. Uh, had conducted a few studies. Uh, so two of them ran in parallel, uh, and it involved uh, evaluating a novel device um, to detect drugs in saliva. And this is important if you think about uh, how people detect uh, drugs uh, in humans. Usually it's through urine, but it also can be a, a blood sample. Urine samples require some amount of privacy, and blood samples are pretty invasive and requires 
someone like a phlebotomist, someone who's trained to extract blood, to be able to do that. That's sometimes hard to do and not always easy. What if we could do it with saliva? And that was basically the question. And what if you had a device that could measure that, uh, the presence of those drugs pretty rapidly? And that was a collaboration that we had with Rice University, which is also in Houston. And um, that particular uh, device was called a programmable bio nanochip. Uh, so using that technology, we wanted to see whether or not we could determine the presence of various drugs of abuse in saliva as compared to uh, the detection in blood. That's the gold standard. If you can do it, detect uh, blood, uh, those drugs in blood. And so we uh, published a couple of manuscripts from that effort. Uh, and uh, the opioids that, that we were evaluating, among other drugs, uh, included morphine and methadone. Okay. Was there more of a follow-up to those studies? So, yes, that, that was the first part of the study, and, and we, you know, knew that that would help uh, push the field forward in the way that we can detect these things in humans. But one of the questions I had was whether or not, you know, we could help patients who are undergoing treatment, uh, but in a different setting. So rather than the I gotcha sort of thing, if their, if their sample, their saliva sample comes back and it shows that it's positive for an opioid, could we use it in a positive way? And the answer is yes. And so we developed a collaboration uh, with a group of physicians uh, who had over 200 buprenorphine maintained patients. I can spell that, but I, you've probably heard that before. Uh, so those patients all met criteria for opioid use disorder, and they were maintained on buprenorphine. And the question that we were ho hoping to address was not only, you know, are the patients taking their medication as prescribed, but are they having occasional slips? And that's important for a physician, because when a physician sits and looks at a patient and asks them questions, have you been taking your medication, they say yes, you pretty much just have to take their word on it. Um, sending blood samples out and determining levels of buprenorphine in blood is very expensive. So you take their word on that. And then, but you can do a, a, a drug test to see whether or not they've abused substances, but it's, it's somewhat imprecise. So the technology, w uh, our hope was, was to be able to determine whether or not someone's taking their drug as prescribed, as well as, hey, did you have any slips during the time that uh, you are being evaluated? Now, you've mentioned several times assessing study participants to determine uh, whether they have a diagnosis of opioid addiction or uh, opioid use disorder, correct? Uh, yes, that's correct. And approximately how many uh, subjects would you say over the years you've assessed in that fashion? Uh, several hundred. And just, again, to be clear, what's the main reason why you're doing that? Because well, you're not treating patients. I'm not treating patients, not a no. not treating physician. Right? I am not a physician. So why are you doing that? Well, so, you know, in order for us to determine whether or not someone is eligible for inclusion in the study, we must know whether or not they're just someone who's a casual user of the drug or they actually meet the diagnostic criteria. And we do that using some standardized instruments that allow us to go through the DSM criteria. Uh, and I'm sure you've heard the, the, the term DSM before. And so uh, we use those DSM criteria to determine whether or not they, they meet uh, uh, the criteria for opioid use disorder, cannabis use disorder, tobacco use disorder, cocaine use disorder, et cetera. So we talked about the work you did uh, at the Baylor College of Medicine. You also, at the same time, uh, were an associate professor and director of research in the Department of Psychiatry at University of Texas, MD Anderson, correct? That is correct. And you probably all heard of MD Anderson, but can you just explain to the court um, what MD Anderson is? So MD Anderson is the number one cancer center in the world. Um, it, it's a very large institution. It has over 24,000 employees. And the focus of, at MD Anderson is cancer. So people who are, are, are being treated for various forms of cancer. So why are you an addiction neuropharmacologist have MD Anderson, which is focusing on cancer patients. So I was recruited there uh, to the Department of Psychiatry to become the director of research. Uh, and the reason why is uh, because that department, um, by its nature, was very heavy clinical. 
and uh, that means if it's mostly MDs, mostly RNs, mostly uh, advanced practice nurses, so a lot of clinical uh, individuals. But in, in the Department of Psychiatry. In, in the Department of Psychiatry with very little to no research experience. So they wanted someone who could come in and help facilitate uh, research within the department, help the uh, individual faculty, which includes MDs, help them uh, develop research programs and uh, understand the research process. And did you help the folks in that department then uh, learn how to develop, conduct research? I hope so. I, I, that was my intent, and I think we, we had some success with that. How did you do that? So, you know, everybody, so when a patient comes into MD Anderson, they, they go to see their primary oncologist, and during the time while they're in the hospital, they may express to their doctor or to someone else that's in the room that they're feeling anxious or they're depressed about something that's going on in their life. And that usually triggers a consult to the Department of Psychiatry. And so the Department of Psychiatry is, is in a completely different building, but the patients will then get an appointment and go to the psycho-oncology clinic. And within the psycho-oncology clinics, that's where all of our clinicians are located all of our MDs and our nurses and our advanced practice nurses. And so when they come there, they're evaluated and then uh, offered treatment uh, of, a, of, of an, any uh, specific sort. What I did at MD Anderson was for the first time establish uh, a, an electronic database to capture uh, data from all the patients who have come through. And uh, to this point, we've collected data from over 3,000 patients. And were you supervising in the research that was being done by others there? Yes, everyone. Everyone? Everyone in the department. Now, in the course of the work you did as director of research, were you aware of what percentage of patients that were referred to the Department of Psychiatry uh, were being treated with opioids? Yes. How did you become aware of that? So we know that because every time a patient comes into the Department of Psychiatry, uh, we use the EPIC uh, electronic health system. Uh, their, all of their information becomes available to us. Every uh, drug that they've been prescribed, every uh, diagnosis that they've received, so the type of cancer that they have, or anything else that they might, might have that's medically relevant. So all of that information is available uh, to us within the Department of Psychiatry. That's important for our clinicians so they know how best to help that patient with whatever problem that they're experiencing and to understand whether or not they need to address any other problems further. And so because of that, we, we absolutely had a finger on who uh, uh, among the patients that were uh, uh, referred to our department, who among them were receiving opioids. Now, the, the, the research you were doing uh, while at Baylor College of Medicine and Indy Anderson, the studies that were being done, were those human studies? Yes, all of them. All human studies? All of them. Now, you've mentioned some of the publications that you've had uh, during the course of your career. I take it there have been others? <laughs> yes. So how many uh, published peer review articles have you had, have you been an author or a co-author that relate to addiction or addiction science? Uh, about 100. And uh, fair to say a pretty substantial body of work? Uh, yes. Are there still some you're trying to uh, get publication? Yeah, we have about five that are uh, in progress. Uh, some have already been uh, submitted and are under review. And we have a couple that are what's called in press. They've already been reviewed. They've been accepted. They're just in the holding pattern for ultimate uh, publication in the journal. And do any of those relate to the subjects of addiction or addiction science? Uh, I would say three of the five. So over the course of your career as a neuropharmacologist, researcher, how many human studies would you say you've designed and conducted that resulted in a peer-reviewed publication? I would say at least 80. And uh, did any of those uh, involve evaluating the efficacy of a chemical compound as a medicine for humans? Yes, the, the vast majority of the work that I did both at UCLA and the Baylor College of Medicine was about evaluating efficacy also evaluate safety. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Okay. Just the other side of the equation? Well, you, I mean, you can't do one without the other. The FDA would not allow us to just submit data on potential efficacy. They're most interested in safety at that level of testing. For phase one testing, it's all about safety. 
and then you can start to say something about efficacy at that point. So uh, as a researcher, have you received grants from any governmental agencies? I have quite a few, from the NIH uh, principally, uh, and the NIH is the National Institutes of Health, and I think the numbers, there are 27 institutes and centers. It might be 21. But uh, there are several institutes and centers, and among them is the National Institute on Drug Abuse. The uh, NIDA uh, is the, the abbreviation, is basically where I've received the majority of my funding. And what is NIDA? Uh, it is the National Institute on Drug Abuse, and it uh, essentially allocates funds to any researcher who is interested in, in evaluating various drugs of abuse, including opioids, cocaine, methamphetamine, et cetera. May I approach your honor? Yes, you may. I think it might be useful to go ahead and hand you your CV. Thank you. I handed you uh, what's been marked Dr. De La Garza as Defendant's Exhibit J 2050A, and the A, Your Honor, uh, just indicates that this is a document that was part of what had previously been marked as Exhibit J 2050, but this just uh, includes, J 2050A just includes uh, Dr. De La Garza's uh, CD. Thank you. And uh, if you just take a quick look, is this your current uh, CD, Dr. De La Garza? It is. Um, does, it, does it announce your retirement yet? <laughs> it does not. You plan to continue to work at this point? Uh, that's hopefully not my intent. <laughs> <laughs> You'll see, right? We'll see. So, uh, Your Honor, I'd move Exhibit J 2050A into evidence. No objection. J 2050A will be admitted. And may we publish? Yes, you may. So, if we could turn to page three. Down at the bottom, it indicates research grants, contracts, currently funded, and then on page four, research grants, contracts completed. And those are the research grants that you've been awarded? Uh, that is correct. Now, um, there, there are a few that uh, show up as grants from the Department of Veterans Affairs, uh, the Department of Defense, Etc. right? That is correct. What were those? So those are different grants that uh, we received. That's, uh, those were specific to the population that's at the VA Medical Center. And so those uh, included evaluation of things like uh, alcohol use disorder um, and PTSD, um, as well as tobacco use disorder. Now you mentioned also NIDA, and the CD lists a number of grants from NIDA, correct? That is correct. How does one go about getting a grant from NIDA or from any of the other national institutes of health? So an individual investigator uh, comes up with a hypothesis uh, and then uh, goes into the literature, uh, the peer-reviewed literature, and tries to find whether or not it makes sense. Uh, are there any other peer-reviewed articles that have covered that topic? Uh, and we, we look for gaps. What are the unknowns uh, in the field? And what is it that I, as a, a scientist, could contribute to the field? So you put together an application. Um, it, it varies in its length uh, according to the type of, of grant that you're applying for. But that you then submit that grant to the National Institutes of Health, specifically NIDA, if you're working on drug addiction, and uh, you uh, have it peer reviewed. Now, it sounds like you know a fair amount about this subject. Quite a bit. Have you both been an applicant as well as a reviewer? I have. And what does it mean to be a reviewer? So being a reviewer uh, implies a lot of responsibility because you have people who are uh, applying for grants from all over the country. Um, they're submitting their best possible ideas to you. Those ideas are, are not only just coming off the top of their head, but they're based upon uh, years of research uh, that's been conducted in their lab or the lab of others. So there's a lot that's put into those applications, and uh, as a reviewer, you are assigned a number of applications that are specific to your area of expertise. And so it, it is up to you, as well as uh, two other individuals, usually it's about three people per 
application to review that grant uh, to determine whether or not it makes sense, whether the, the science is strong, and whether the um, outcomes, if they were to come true, would be helpful. Will it push the field forward? And so we make a determination and, and we provide what's called a priority score. Um, and that tells you know, how, the, the applicant how well they did. How does one get to be a reviewer for uh, applications for National Institutes of Health grants? So one is invited to, uh, to become a reviewer. So uh, you, you can't self-nominate, uh, you, you, know, you can't write a letter and say, I would, you know, would, would like to bring myself to your attention. Uh, it's, it's, it's a matter of, of your standing in the field, and it's a matter of what you have accomplished up to that point and the expertise that you've developed. And so uh, the NIH uh, review panels each have chairs for the, the different study sections. And there are multiple study sections, hundreds of them. And so there are chairs, and then there are actual members, standing members on those committees. And, and those individuals will bring names up and say, we'd like to you know, uh, ask Dr. De La Garza to join this committee because we think he has specific expertise that might be useful in the review of certain grants. And, and, and what fields do you serve as a reviewer for? Basically, just about any addiction grant that comes through. And have some of those included uh, studies involving opioids? Yes, they have. Uh, how many uh, applications for NIH grants would you say you've reviewed over the years? Uh, I would say s several hundred, at least 200. Now, looking at the other side of the equation, your applications for grants. Yes. Uh, can you put? Uh, can you quantify in some way the amount of grants that you've actually been awarded by NIDA? So um, right now, I think the figure exceeds uh, $11 million. Now, if you take a look back at your CV on page three, where the, where the contract's currently funded, you'll see number one is a grant from Promentus Pharmaceuticals. That's correct. And what did that grant involve? So that's a, a small pharmaceutical company. Uh, Promentis um, uh, is, is a company that wanted to evaluate a specific compound. They're, they have a, a unique compound that has not yet received FDA approval. Uh, right, for just stop for a second. It'll be the prior page, I think. We have a little bit of numbering difference. But um, on the actual exhibit, it's J twenty fifty A yeah, so it's the zero, zero zero three. There we go. So it's item one there, right? That's correct. So what is that grant? Yeah, so that particular grant uh, was a small grant by a small pharmaceutical company to evaluate uh, a novel compound uh, for potential use in individuals who are cigarette smokers. And they weren't uh, interested in efficacy per se. They were interested in whether or not it would impact cognitive functioning. Uh, and so they wanted to know whether or not we could do computerized cognitive assessments uh, both before and after treatment with their compound and see whether or not there are any changes that occur to cognitive function as a function of that treatment. Now, see that uh, this list, $405,460 direct costs, was all of that grant funded? Uh, unfortunately, the study was stopped uh, early, and so I think the, the final total was only about 84000 Now, this was a, a grant that was funded by a pharmaceutical company, correct? That is correct. Does that affect the independence of the study that's performed? Not at all. Why not? Well, the, you know, the pharmaceutical company uh, came to us. They asked us if we were interested in this project. And then we sat down with them and told them what we thought would be the best possible experiment to conduct. We set out the methodology, mostly me. We set out the methodology telling them, you know, this is what we've done in the past. This is how we think we should do it for your particular study. This is the population that we think we should recruit. Um, these are the, the rates at which we think we'll have uh, enrollment of individuals in, into the study. Uh, et cetera. So there's, uh, there's a back and forth in terms of, of the study design, but the actual conduct of the study was done 100% by us as researchers. They were never in the building, as it were. Um, it was my staff, uh, the, the, my physicians that worked with me uh, who uh, interviewed the patients. And then ultimately, the uh, study analysis of the data is conducted by us, 
and then the reporting of the of the data when it occurs for this particular study will be by us. And is that dynamic consistent with other experiences you've had uh, with research that's been funded at least in part by a pharmaceutical company? Yes, absolutely. Anything unusual about that? No, I mean that's the way it's done. Now this particular study, uh, did it involve opioids? Uh, so we did the same thing that we do for all of our studies. We are evaluating uh, individuals for recent opioid use. Uh, we do evaluate for opioid use disorder using the diagnostic criteria. Did this particular study uh, look at all on pathways and the effect on impulsivity and inhibitory control? Well, the, the mere fact that we were doing computerized uh, cognitive assessments was tapping into whether or not they could perform those tasks. And one of the tasks that we did perform was uh, an imp impulsivity task, a, a go-no-go task. And had you performed studies that addressed the go-no-go task before? Yes, several. Over the course of your career, how many times would you say you conducted those types of studies? I would say at least a dozen, maybe 15 times. So, um, just asking about the grant money, whether it's paid by uh, a pharmaceutical company or by NIDA, does it get paid to you directly? No, the, the money never comes to us directly as scientists. Uh, and if a physician were to apply for a grant and receive it, that physician would not receive the money. The money goes to the university or the medical school and it's held there and it's then allocated as a function of whatever you said needed to occur, you know, for salaries for for the individuals that are in your lab or to buy equipment or to buy supplies, that sort of thing. And has your personal compensation been impacted by the amount of grants that are awarded and paid to your employers? Uh, never. I'm paid exactly the same amount whether I have one grant or five grants. So take a look back at your CV and on page three it lists a number of honors or awards uh, there's a whole host of them there, and I'm not going to embarrass you by going through all of them, but I do want to just ask about two in particular. The 2009 award for the Texas A&M University Commerce Distinguished Alumnus, what was that award? So I was um, nominated for and then uh, given the honor of being a distinguished alumnus of my alma mater, which is Texas A&M University Commerce. And again, I know you don't really want to talk too much about it, but is that a significant award? It is. It's, a, it's, it's quite a distinction. The, the university has been around for over a century, um, and I am about the 100th distinguished alumnus that has been named by the university. And what about right under that, the National Academy of Sciences? Is it Cavley Fellow? Oh, Cavley Fellow, that's correct. What is that? So uh, the National Academy of Sciences uh, represents the, the best scientists in the country for all fields of science. So it's not just neuroscience and it's not uh, you know, just biology. It can be chemistry, it can be physics, it can be earth sciences, but it's the best sciences uh, in the country. A Cavley Fellow uh, is a recognition for up and coming scientists. Uh, and they, they use a very generous definition of a young scientist, so 50 and under. Uh, and so I barely uh, met the criteria. Well, I think we say 40. I don't know if that's yeah. good or bad. Yeah. So, um, but I was named a Cavley Fellow, uh, which is uh, quite an honor. So how old are you now? Uh, no one knows exactly. <laughs> I, I think 55. Okay. You're a young 55. Thank you. You shouldn't be retired. <laughs> um, so look back at your CV, if you would, at page 7. You're going to start at the bottom of page uh, 6. various scientific societies, correct? Uh, that's correct. And again, quite a few that are listed, but let me just ask you about the College on Problems of Drug Dependence. What is that? So the College on the Problems of Drug Dependence is the largest and oldest scientific society dedicated to addiction research in the country. Uh, so it, it's made up of both MDs and PhDs and their trainees, all the, the up and coming students. Uh, and the, the college is a, a once annual meeting in which these investigators come together and they present their unique or novel findings. And uh, it cuts across all fields uh, of addiction. So opioid use, methamphetamine, cocaine, tobacco, all of the fields. And it cuts across all the uh, different animal models that we talked about. So rodents, 
non-human primates, and a lot of human research. And I see looking at your CV, you've been a member of the board of directors, a member of the executive committee, and president of that organization. Yes, that's correct. And also a fellow. What is a fellow? A fellow is the highest uh, level of membership that can be achieved, and it's only for individuals who are past presidents uh, of the college, and it's also uh, a high distinction for an individual uh, who has accomplished a great deal of, of, uh, of things in, in his or her career in addiction over time that uh, had not previously been nominated as an officer for the college. And are, are all of these organizations, or most of these organizations that are listed here, do they focus on addiction and addiction science? Yes, the vast majority of them, yes. Now, I want to go back to something we talked briefly about, and that is uh, peer review. Okay. And you have served as a peer reviewer? Yes, I have. For how many journals? Uh, I would say at least two dozen, maybe three dozen journals. And we take a look back at your CV. This would be on page five. There's a listing of biomedical journals. And does that then list the various journals for which you've served as a peer reviewer? Uh, it does. Now, it starts out by a reference to being on the editorial board of the Experimental and Clinical uh, Psychopharmacology Journal. What is that? So that's a peer-reviewed journal. Uh, we accept uh, publications that are specific to addiction, but also other uh, aspects of clinical psychopharmacology. So psychopharmacology can encompass other areas of brain function that, does, that do not have to do with addiction. But the articles that, that I'm always interested in are those that, that are specific to addiction. So how does one become a member of the editorial board, and what does one do as a member of the editorial board? So uh, like some of the other things that I've described, one is invited uh, to become a member of the editorial board, and it's usually a matter of uh, distinction uh, for that particular individual. So they've accomplished uh, a great deal. They've published a great deal. They're recognized in the field as someone who uh, you know, is eligible to be on the board. And then uh, under that, listed ad hoc reviewer, and that's what? Well, that's a, a peer reviewer. And that means, you know, uh, you know, whenever someone um, wants an article reviewed, we uh, are, are provided an invitation to do it, and then we either accept it or decline it. And how does one get to be a peer reviewer? That's the uh, decision of the editor or the associate editor of, of any given journal. And so they do the same thing. Uh, what happens is if uh, an article is submitted to a journal for a publication or for publication, uh, the editor then has to decide, well, who should I send this out to? Uh, who are the best people who can review this? And so uh, someone uh, like me has uh, expertise in a variety of areas. And so I might be deemed a, a good reviewer for a specific article that's been submitted. So over the years, how many articles would you say uh, you have served as a peer reviewer for? Uh, several hundred. And in particular, let me just refer you back to your CV. One of the journals is the American Journal of Psychiatry. Yes. What is that? So the American Journal of Psychiatry is the top tier journal uh, within uh, the field of, of psychiatry. It's called the Green Journal, uh, and it's, it's one that most uh, scientists aspire to to uh, submit articles to and have published there, and so to be a reviewer for them uh, is quite an honor. I take it that most of the articles or studies that you're serving as a peer reviewer for deal with addiction. Uh, yes, that's correct. Uh, any of those deal specifically with opioids or opioid addiction? Yes. And can you give an estimate of that? You know, I, I review on average about six articles per month. Um, and over the course of a year, I might review 10 uh, total articles on opioids. So I should ask you this, because if I don't, I know one of the state's lawyers will. Um, I always ask our witnesses about their connection to Oklahoma. So uh, have you been to Oklahoma before you came here to testify? I have several times. And what has brought you to Oklahoma? Well, so just as a reminder, I, I grew up in North Texas in Dallas. Um, I used to come with my family to, uh, to vacation here to uh, Lake Texoma with my grandfather. Um, I've been here several times. Uh, as an adult, as a researcher, I've had students in my lab who've come to the Oklahoma Health Sciences Center and have completed their training here. Um, 
I've had friends here. And then more recently, when I come to visit my mom, she likes to come up to the casinos. And so um, I have company. Her. <clears throat> I've, been, I've been here twice before this year uh, alone just, just to do that. Now, do you know if any of the participants in any of the studies that you've done over the years have been from Oklahoma? <laughs> So I don't know for sure. I mean, you know, being that we're in Texas uh, this, this last 11 years, uh, we get patients that come from all over. And the, the people who enroll in our studies have lived all over the United States. And so I don't know for sure if, if I've had any uh, Oklahoman who has joined one of our studies. In the research and the studies that you do, does it really matter whether someone's from Oklahoma, Texas, California, New York? It, it really doesn't. So, Your Honor, um, we would uh, offer Dr. De La Garza as an expert on addiction neuropharmacology and neurobiology, addiction science, uh, including scientific studies and literature regarding addiction, and development and efficacy of medications, including opioids. I'd like to reserve my questions to my cross-examination of those issues. We'll let you do that, Mr. Wooden. Thank you, Your Honor. May I proceed then? Yes, you may. So, um, Dr. De La Garza, let me start out. There's been uh, a fair amount of evidence about published studies and articles. Yes. And is there a hierarchy of uh, scientific literature in terms of the scientific weight that would be given to a particular uh, article or study? Yes, absolutely. What I'd like to do is walk through that, just to develop some terminology and try to develop that hierarchy, if I might. And Your Honor, may we use a slide that uh, Dr. De La Garza has prepared for this purpose? And I think Any objection by the state? Have you seen the slide? Objection. You may publish. May I approach, Your Honor? Yes. Do want to mark this as a court exhibit? Yeah, let's mark it as court exhibit 178. Okay, we could pull that up then. So, uh, and I'm sorry, Your Honor, what exhibit is it? 178. 178. So looking at this first slide, we see on the left uh, higher quality and lower quality, and then on the right, objective and risk of bias. So what are we looking at? Well, basically, I'm, I'm going to go through the different tiers uh, of, of types of articles that are submitted and published in a journal, uh, and they're not all equal, is, is basically the take-home message. Uh, and so some of them are lower quality, and some are, are uh, of much higher quality. And as you get to higher quality, those articles tend to be more objective. Uh, the ones that, at the lower end have a risk of bias. And when we're talking about bias, bias of whom? Well, it can be both, you know, bias in terms of the individuals that are being discussed, uh, as well as the scientists themselves. So it, it goes both ways. So both the researchers and the subjects. That's correct. So what would be the lowest on this uh, hierarchy of scientific evidence? So the lowest would be editorials and expert opinions. And those are basically uh, what it sounds like, uh, expert opinions an individual, a scientist, a, a physician who has something important to say and, and on the basis of their uh, experience, whether it be clinical or research, they want to make a, a point and they want that point shared with the larger scientific community. Uh, and so that is at the lowest uh, end because it doesn't have any new data. Uh, it doesn't include uh, any specific experiment. It's just someone's opinion. And. Are editorials and expert opinions, are they typically peer-reviewed? They're not typically peer-reviewed, no. Why they, is that? Well, it's just it's, it's, uh, the, the, the um, editor himself or herself can make a decision as to whether or not this particular uh, letter to the editor or editorial is of sufficient interest to the readership. But not peer-reviewed? Not generally peer-reviewed. Okay. What's the next uh, level up? The next level up are case reports or case studies, uh, sometimes they're called. And these can be uh, when you have one patient, two, up to three patients. And it's a matter of a physician, generally, uh, who wants to describe something that's unique, that's occurring 
in his or her lab or, or in his or her clinic. And so this is uh, useful because what uh, they're doing is trying to bring to the attention of, of readers of the journal something that's n unique that's going on. And they say, well, you know, we haven't seen this before and we think this is interesting. And here's what we make of it. Uh, so it's, it's better than just an expert opinion or an editorial because you're actually including uh, uh, an evaluation of specific patients. And again, it can be one to three patients. Why are case reports and studies uh, lower in the hierarchy then? Well, because it's, it's not prospective. You're, uh, you're not you know, looking at a patient and then following them over time and, and seeing what the outcomes are. And it's not even retrospective. You're not looking back to see how they were at a given point in time. It's just a single snapshot of what's in front of you at that given moment. There's no placebo control. And so it's just observational. You're just you're making some observations uh, and then you're uh, making a report on that. Uh, are case reports and studies peer reviewed? Uh, they are. Okay. Same process you described earlier? Yes. So it gives it a little more weight than the editorials and the expert opinions? Yes. Okay. So what's the next level up? So those are cross-sectional studies and or surveys. Cross-sectional studies um, generally involve the use of databases. Um, and like the database that I uh, created at MD Anderson, it's an electronic database. And we've published uh, several cross-sectional, uh, or we've published several studies uh, that are cross-sectional in nature. And that, what that means is that you can just go back in time and you can take a snapshot of what was happening, say, a year ago. Uh, and what are uh, some of the symptoms that are present in the sample of individuals at that particular time point. That's a cross-sectional study. So it's just a snapshot at that time. Does the fact that uh, cross-sectional studies and surveys are based on data give it additional scientific weight? Yes, absolutely. Because when we, you know, when we've done it, you know, we, we have several different uh, scientific assessments that are being conducted. So we know a lot about the patient. We know everything about their demographics and their drug use and mental health use or, or mental health disorders. Uh, as well as we have specific questionnaires. So we know about their depression, their anxiety, uh, anything else that's going on about them. So when we make a determination as to what might be going on for them, we know quite a bit. And uh, cross-sectional studies and surveys tend to be several hundred people, uh, sometimes thousands. Fair to say that most studies have limitations of some sort? Yeah, there's certainly limitations in most studies. Inherent in the process? It's, it's in inherent. So for cross-sectional studies and surveys, what are the principal limitations? Well, it's principally because you are just taking a snapshot. You're, you're, you're not considering what happened before and you're not uh, considering have, what has happened since. So you're taking that snapshot and you're making some observations about that particular time point. So, you know, that's problematic in, in that specific way. Uh, it would be better to have more data if possible. Does the, the, the scientific weight to be given to a cross-sectional study or survey depend in part on the source of the data? It does because um, the sources of the data can be one that's very local, like my, my collecting data specifically at MD Anderson, that's one database and that's one specific population. Uh, but you know that doesn't necessarily mean that it's nationally representative. There are national databases that, that, that are more reflective of the U.S. population as a whole. And if we're trying to understand a complex disease, it's better to have a nationally representative sample. And would the number of patients that are uh, the subject of the data also impact the scientific weight that would be given to a cross-sectional study or survey? Yes, absolutely. I mean, if you have a sample that has only 17 uh, participants versus a sample of 1,700 participants, uh, that's quite a difference in, in the weight that would be given to the study that had 1,700 per, uh, uh, participants would be much higher. So what's the next level? So those are case control or cohort studies. What are those? So basically, it's, a, it's also a retrospective sort of study design. And what you do is have a known outcome of interest. And so the outcome of interest could be opioid use disorder. And then what you want to do is con uh, compare those individuals to those that do not have opioid use disorder. And you look backwards in time and you try to identify what factors may have given ri uh, rise to this particular diagnosis. That's a, a, a case control or cohort study. These are the two cohorts. 
So why are case control and cohort studies better, better than or given more scientific weight than cross-sectional studies or surveys? Because generally now you do have all that data that's in between where you're at currently and where you're looking back towards. And uh, again, remember uh, the cross-sectional studies, just a snapshot right here. You don't know anything that's happened up to uh, current day or anything in the past. But with a cohort study, you start here and you look backwards in time and say, what are the factors that may have contributed to this and given rise to these two different groups of people? Okay. Uh, are there studies then that would provide uh, better quality evidence, be given more scientific weight than the case control and cohort studies? Yes. And what are those? So those are randomized controlled trials. Um, and that's basically where I've spent the majority of my career. So. And, and since, you, since you went to UCLA? That's correct. Okay. Yeah. So, so what, random, what are they? Okay. So randomized controlled trials basically involve a prospective study design. Uh, a scientist or physician decides they want to study something that's important. And it can be a behavioral intervention. It could be a pharmacological intervention, so a potential medication. So they design the study and they say, well, who are the individuals that we want to study? What's the population? And so you have inclusion and exclusion criteria. And you decide, so what are we going to measure? So you determine what are the instruments that you will use uh, to, uh, in that particular study. You make sure that those are uh, widely accepted instruments uh, to evaluate that outcome. Uh, and you determine the appropriate duration for the study. And that could be a few days. It could be uh, several weeks, uh, up to three months. And so that's a prospective study design. And uh, the best randomized controlled trials tend to have a placebo arm. Uh, sometimes they have more than one uh, active medication arm. So they can have one dose, a high dose, and a low dose versus placebo. But you can also have uh, the, the one dose of the medication versus an active comparator, something that you already know has an effect and, and can uh, do something. Let's just break that up. So one you mentioned was placebo. Yes. So just to be clear, what's that? Placebo is an inactive uh, ingredient that's in a, encapsulated uh, and, and given to the patient. So the patient doesn't know. When we do studies of this sort, uh, they tend to be double blind. And what that means is that neither the investigator nor the patient knows what they're being administered. And that's really important in, in well-controlled uh, and well-conducted science because uh, you, you don't want to be influenced. If, if you know the patient is receiving the medication of interest, you kind of t t tend to look in that direction for something to happen. If you have a placebo control, that eliminates that bias that may, may so, occur. So is the placebo uh, double blind sort of gold standard of the randomized controlled trials? That's, cor that's correct. Are there other types of randomized controlled trials out there? Well, I mean, there, there are open label trials. Uh, what is an open label trial? So an open label trial is basically just the active medication itself. And so you have a, a group of participants, say you have individuals who all are all endorsing pain. And so you randomize uh, them all to the active medication. All of the participants are being given the active medication. So it's unblinded. The participants know they're getting the medication, the physician and the scientist knows that they're getting the medication. But what's important and why this is still valid is you're still using specific instruments to determine whether or not pain changes over time as a function of that treatment. And so not everybody responds. And even those who respond have differential response rates. Some may have 50% reduction in pain while others may have only 30% reduction in pain. And so that's why it's, there's still validity to collecting data that way. You also mentioned something called an active comparator. Yes. Is that yet another type of randomized controlled trial? Yeah, that's basically, so instead of having this open label design where everybody gets the same thing, uh, you know, a better design would be to compare it to something that's already known to have an effect. So it, it could be something like an opioid versus uh, a different type of opioid that's already approved and on the market, or it could be versus an NSAID, uh, a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug. Uh, and so having that active comparator allows you to make this comparison uh, whether or not the uh, effects produced on pain in this particular example are similar in magnitude or uh, is one better than the other. 
and then certainly safety can be a part of the analyses that are conducted. So speaking of one better than another, if randomized controlled or clinical trials are at the top of the chart, why not always do them as part of the studies that are being done? Well, I mean, it's not always practical. Uh, and, and for the most part, it's not always necessary. So there's a lot of data that can be obtained at, at each of these levels, starting at the, at the level of the cross-sectional studies. I'll, I'll be a little bit hard on case reports and say they're not as useful. It's a starting point. You can do some hypothesis formation at that level. But cross-sectional studies can be quite informative, can tell us a, a good amount. Cohort studies, even better. But yes, RCTs, randomized controlled trials, uh, would be the gold standard and are the gold standard in terms of the FDA and ultimate approval of a medication for any indication. But if you don't have a randomized controlled trial or clinical trial, does that mean you can't reach a conclusion to a reasonable degree of scientific certainty? Certainly not. Why not? Well, because you know, the data that's obtained at each of these levels uh, is, is generally of high quality. And the reason why we know they're of high quality is that they end up in peer-reviewed journals. Uh, the, uh, again, when, when a person has conducted a study and then they submit it to a journal for peer review, it's sent out and that process is blinded. You don't know who receives your article. You don't know who is, is, is providing that, those comments. And so they will say whether or not they feel like that uh, science is sufficiently meritorious. Was it conducted well enough? Do the data make sense? So each of these levels pr provides uh, sufficient uh, data that are useful for understanding various concepts of disease. Now, are there other things one can do to these studies, or at least certain of these studies, to give them even additional scientific weight? Sure. You can actually go one level further, and I think there should be one more animation, and, and do what are known as meta-analyses and or systematic reviews. And so what that entails is basically you have a, a bunch of these studies that have been uh, conducted, and you want to determine whether or not there's something that you can say about the sum of those studies, the, 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 the group of those studies. So it's not just one uh, randomized uh, uh, controlled trial, but maybe several and or components from each of those sections. And can you do a systematic review or a meta-analysis on more than just the randomized controlled trials? Yes, absolutely. And what other studies can you apply those techniques to? Basically any of those that are shown there. So the cross-sectional studies, the cohort studies, or RCTs. So is there a difference between a systematic review and a meta-analysis? There is. I mean, the, the systematic reviews basically are what it sounds like. It's a review of what's known so far. They tend to be uh, less quantitative. They tend to be more descriptive. And so you, you might speak in percentages. This percent of the studies so far have shown this. Uh, this number of individuals uh, exhibited that. Uh, whereas a meta-analysis actually applies a statistic, and that statistic tends to be numerical. It's a, it's a quantifiable feature, uh, and so it, it has more weight uh, in terms of the, the quality of the review that's provided. But as to both the systematic review and the meta-analysis, which I, I take it from your answer just is more of a quantification? It, it is for quantification, and it just it provides a better amount of certainty you know, as to you know, what, what happened and, and some degree of confidence for it. But those techniques can be applied to the top three layers, correct? Yes. And, can, and so you're looking at a number of different studies and then collecting data from those studies and then trying to reach conclusions from the broader perspective. That's correct. And um, can you do a systematic review or a meta-analysis that would uh, look at uh, different types of studies, for example, that could include a randomized control trial, a case control cohort studies, cross-sectional studies? Yeah, that's generally how most of the, the reports that are published look like. They tend to include uh, components from each of, the, each of those categories. So you mix and match? Yes, that happens a lot. So I want to turn to some specific studies now, if I might. Okay. Mr. Yoder, well, uh, I'm going to interrupt you. We're going to go ahead and take a morning break. Uh, let's stop now and resume again at 1040. Thank you.
the, this is the basis. This is the NBA. And, you know, you, you want what's best for us at Westbrook. I bet you that. That'd be cool if you could. One more game. Just give me one more game. Uh, we'll take a lot of money. I want to take a chair. And let's do it during mom innings. And enjoy it. And show us some skill. You don't need him for game one, Yanni. Oh, man. He'll be fine. All right. We'll take a time out. And when we come back, we'll get kind of who the top story in the in the news. Josh has everything else. Uh, the Plank Show. And again, if you're just
for fun and exciting events for the entire year. At the Thriller, you'll find golf at its very best and the friendliest staff in Norman. Call the membership office at 364-3790 or visit trailsgolf.com. The Trails Golf Club, the right course, the right price, and the right time. OEC Pilots, the most outstanding company that brought OEC 81 years ago. We are reinvesting in Oklahoma every day. High-speed fiber services for your homes, businesses, and schools. Make sure to visit us at oecfibers.com. And sign up for updates to stay in the loop as we continue to build out our network. OEC Fibers, we're taking high-speed internet where no one else will. Please be seated. You may resume with Dr. De La Garza. Thank you, Your Honor. So, Dr. De La Garza, as part of the work you've done as an expert in this case, have you reviewed uh, the trial testimony of any witnesses? I have. And did you review the trial testimony of one of the state's uh, expert witnesses, Dr. Maslin Deuce? I did. And I want to show you a portion of that, Your Honor, if I can have a permission to publish. Yes, you may. This is uh, from the June 6, 2019 morning session uh, at page 134, line 12 to 21. And you'll see there uh, Dr. Maslin Deuce was asked, uh, the following questions and gave the following answers. Question, as you understand it, does the FDA approved indication and usage for Nucenta ER limit the usage to treatment of cancer pain? Answer, no, sir. Question, is that true as well for duragesic? Answer, yes. I believe it's approved for non-malignant pain as well. It doesn't specify the duration of time, however the FDA, and then this is really what I want to focus on, <clears throat> and there's really never been any evidence demonstrating efficacy of long-acting opioids for long-term pain. That's the issue that I have with what they were misrepresenting. 
So I want to ask you, do you agree with Dr. Maslin Deuce that there has never been any evidence demonstrating efficacy of long-acting opioids for long-term pain? I would disagree. Is there scientific evidence that demonstrates the efficacy of long-acting opioids for long-term or chronic pain? Yes, absolutely. Okay, I'd like to talk about some of that literature then. Um, first, if I may approach, Your Honor. Yes, you may. I'm going to hand you a document that has been marked and has been admitted as State um, 2523. Uh, this is what's been referred to as the Simpson part. May I publish it? Yes, you may. So are you familiar with this uh, article or this study, Dr. Dillagarza? I am. Uh, so is this one of the articles that you've reviewed uh, for purposes of offering your opinions here today? I did. What's the, uh, what's the title of this uh, study or article? It's uh, Transdermal Fentanyl as Treatment for Chronic Low Back Pain. And Transdermal Fentanyl, that's the fentanyl patch? That is correct. Yeah. Uh, Duragesic is a transdermal fentanyl patch? Yes, it is. Okay. When was this study published? So this study was published in 1996. In what publication? Uh, actually, uh, it's 1997. Uh, so it's the journal Pain and Symptom Management. And who are the authors? It's uh, Richard Simpson and colleagues. And Your Honor, we have a slide that we're using to go through some of these articles, if I may publish that. Yes, you may. So um, we've been talking about different types of studies. So for the Simpson study, what type of study was it? This is an open label clinical trial. An open label meaning? Uh, basically that there was no comparator arm. So what was the duration of the study? It was 30 days. How many patients were involved? There were 50 patients. Was this a peer reviewed article? Yes, it was. And what were the results from this particular study? So basically, that uh, transdermal fentanyl uh, was effective as a treatment for chronic low back pain. So take a look at uh, page two of exhibit S2523. You can go back to that and make Ms. Conway work a little bit. And in the abstract down at the bottom, does that report on the conclusions of the authors of the Simpson study? It, it does. And if we could blow that up, what were their conclusions? So basically, uh, that uh, significant improvements in pain relief and disability was found with the transdermal fentanyl compared with oral opioids. And um, also that it's an effective alternative to oral opioids for the management of chronic low back pain. Now, I want to have you take a look at page six. And in the left column, uh, the end of the paragraph that flows over from page five, there's a statement, the present study, an open label study of relatively short duration, has several potential limitations, including the possibility of bias, and the results, therefore, should be interpreted with caution. Do you see that? I do. Now, that is a disclosed limitation of this study, right? It is. And as you testified earlier, uh, all studies have certain limitations, right? That's absolutely correct. Okay, does this limitation cause you to dismiss the results of the Simpson study? Not at all. Why not? Well, there are limitations for every study that's conducted, and so it's a matter of just disclosing what those are, uh, but the, the data are the data. Uh, the outcomes uh, are quite clear for this particular study, and so those don't change as a function of those weaknesses. Does the fact that a study have limitations mean that it doesn't provide reliable scientific evidence? Absolutely not. Take a look at the next page, page seven. <clears throat> Down under the acknowledgement, 
It indicates that the study was supported by a grant from the Janssen Pharmaceutica Research Foundation, correct? That's correct. Okay. Does the fact that there was a grant from Janssen for this study cause you concern? Not at all. Why not? Well, the vast majority of all research uh, that is conducted that involves a compound uh, for a specific pharmaceutical company tends to be funded by those pharmaceutical companies. Does it uh, mean that you, there's no uh, reliable scientific weight that can be given to it? Not at all. Uh, as I tried to explain earlier, the, the fact is, is that scientists, physicians, retain their independence in the actual con conduct of the study as well as um, the uh, present, uh, presentation of the results of those studies. And then all of these articles undergo peer review, and that's completely separate. So the data that, that are presented here are sound. Now, um, are the other studies that we'll be covering here uh, also funded by a grant in part, at least from Janssen? That's correct. So let me hand you another of those, if I might. May I approach you on it? Yes, you may. been marked as uh, Defendant's Exhibit J706. And are you familiar with this article, Dr. Dilagarza? I am. And is this uh, article you reviewed uh, for purposes of arriving at your opinions in this matter? I have. And did you rely upon this article? I did. And is this a type of uh, literature that uh, experts in your field would typically and reasonably rely on? Certainly. Your Honor, I would ask that Exhibit J706 be admitted. J706 will be admitted. So if we could publish, Your Honor? Yes, you may. Thank you. So what's the title of this article? A Prolonged Treatment with Transdermal Fentanyl in Neuropathic Pain. Who are the authors? Uh, the authors are Delmagen uh, and colleagues. What uh, publication was this uh, published in? Uh, it was also in the Journal of Pain and Symptom Management. And what year was it published? Uh, 1998. Now, just looking at the names, uh, was this study done in the United States? Uh, it was not. Does that matter? <laughs> no. Why not? Well, uh, people are, are all basically similar. The brain functions exactly the same way in the Netherlands as it does here in the United States. So if we could bring the slide back up, Ms. Conway. So for this study, uh, what type of study was it? So this was an open label clinical trial. And for how long uh, was the study conducted? Uh, this study was conducted for 12 weeks. Now, did, did the patients get tracked for longer than 12 weeks? So there was a subset of patients who continued on uh, the transdermal patch for up to two years. And were those patients tracked up through that two-year period? Yes, they were. And how many patients were uh, involved in this particular study? Overall, the number of patients was 48. So if you take a look, if we can go back to page, and that, was this peer reviewed? Yes, it was. If you go back to exhibit J706, Ms. Conway, on page five, there's a flow chart there and that might help explain how this particular study was actually conducted. We can blow up that top flow chart. All right, so how was the study conducted? Uh, basically, this is an open label clinical trial, so everybody's receiving the transdermal patch. Uh, and then this sort of flow chart just tells you what the disposition is for the patients. So even though there were 50 eligible patients, two of them refused to actually start the study. So that 48 were then included and then continued forward. And then of those 48, 30 completed the, the, the full 12 week study. Then it goes further to say that. Uh, and, and you can see the disposition of, 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 of it, the individuals who did not. So 18 were, were withdrawn uh, before the 12 weeks. And so the, uh, the numbers do add up. 13 then resumed uh, the transdermal patch uh, after the washout period. Uh, and then uh, nine of them actually continued uh, for greater than two years. 
What is a washout period? Well, it's a period of, uh, after which you, you are no longer given the active medication that was part of the original study trial design. So even after that period of time, then, there were at least nine that continued on for at least two years? That's correct. Is it a concern that there are a number of patients or subjects who withdrew from the study? It's not surprising. There, there are always people who drop out of the study, and it can be for a variety of reasons. Uh, they're no longer wanting to be a part of the study, no longer uh, able to come to the clinic uh, the number of times that is necessary. Um, and, and some of them may have withdrawn because they didn't like the side effects that were being produced by the, the drug. Does the fact that there are patients or subjects that withdrew from this study mean that it's not providing reliable scientific evidence? Not at all. So what were the principal conclusions of the authors of this study? So the, uh, the principal conclusions are that the transdermal patch was effective in reducing pain. So if we could take a look at page one of exhibit J706, Actually, why don't we go to page eight? Actually, go to page one first, down at the bottom of the abstract. I'm sorry, Ms. Conway. And is the conclusion stated at the bottom of the abstract on page one of the exhibit? It is. And what was the conclusion? So the primary conclusion was that uh, long-term transdermal fentanyl may be an effective non-cancer neuropathic, uh, effective in non-cancer neuropathic pain without clinically significant management problems. And now I do want to have you look at page eight. And in the first paragraph in the left column, there's a statement, relief of pain intensity and pain unpleasantness was similar, supporting our previous findings that FEN, that's fentanyl, right? Yes. Uh, and here we're talking about a patch, right? That's correct. Has an intrinsic analgesic effect not related to its euphoria properties. What does that mean? So we know that opioids, like other drugs of abuse, uh, impact the dopamine system. So it's going to produce euphoria for some individuals. It's going to produce pleasurable effects. And one of the hypotheses that's been put forward is maybe that's you know, why people are using opioids, and, and that's the only reason. So the euphoria sort of masks over the pain? Uh, perhaps, you know, if it, it, it's a, you know, you have some pleasure, and so you're no longer thinking about the pain. So but what's this passage suggesting? Bas basically, this passage is suggesting that they could dissociate the two, that there was pain relief in the absence of it actually producing euphoria properties. So pain relief from the, the uh, fentanyl patch? That's correct different from euphoria. Yes. Okay. So you said you um, reviewed Dr. Maslindu's trial testimony, correct? I did. And did you see his trial testimony where he testified that opioids don't fix the underlying cause of pain, they don't even necessarily numb the pain, they just make you care less about the pain? I did see it. And is that at odds with the report here from this particular study? Very much so. So if we look at the right column on that same page, page 8, I want to direct your attention down to the final paragraph. And it reads, feared opioid-induced side effects such as respiratory depression, the induction of severe depression and psychological dependence were not observed. And then if you go over to the next page, uh, it continues, after two years, tolerance developed in only one patient. You see that? I do. So um, what uh, are the authors of this study reporting here? So basically that, you know, the, the, the compound the transdermal fentanyl was safe, it was well tolerated, and then even in those, uh, the subset of individuals who continued for up to two years or greater than two years, that uh, tolerance developed in only one of the nine individuals. So it wasn't common. And others have talked about tolerance, but when we're talking about tolerance here, what is that referring to? Basically, you know, not being able to respond to the medication in the same way you did when you started 
so you need higher doses. But we have, in this particular case, uh, a group of individuals who continue treatment for up to two years, and only one of those uh, nine developed any uh, signs of tolerance. And if we can just go back to the, to the prior page, Ms. Conway. <clears throat> And they were making the statement that here opioid induced side effects such as respiratory depression, the induction of severe depression, and psychological dependence were not observed. What are they referring to uh, when they're talking about psychological dependence? So that you know, this is the pub this article was published in 1998, and this is the time that we were using DSM-4 criteria, and that would have been synonymous with the diagnosis of addiction or dependence on, on opioids. And so they said that none of the individuals that uh, were included in the trial and had made it through this point uh, for 12 weeks uh, exhibited those sorts of symptoms. So I want to um, turn back to Dr. Maslin-Dew's testimony. And when you reviewed his testimony, did you see his testimony that even a single injection of fentanyl will increase people's uh, both pain sensitivity and also the region of the pain that's affected. You see, did you see that when you reviewed his testimony? I remember reading it, yes. Do you agree with uh, Dr. Maz Lemdeus in that regard? I, d I don't uh, agree with him. Why not? Well, I think the data that have been presented uh, so far in this article and, and the ones that we have already reviewed suggest that that's not the case. Uh, let me uh, hand you another article that's also been mentioned during the trial, if I might. May I approach, Your Honor? Yes, you may. So I have handed you uh, an article uh, that I believe was marked previously as Court Exhibit 129. We put uh, an actual defendant's exhibit uh, number on it as J3945. And are you familiar with this uh, article, Dr. De La Garza? I am. And is this an article that you reviewed for purposes of forming your opinions uh, as an expert in this case? I did. And is this also uh, the type of material that experts in your field would rely upon in forming opinions? Yes, absolutely. Your Honor, I move exhibit J3945 into evidence. No objection. J3945 will be admitted. You may we publish, Your Honor? Yes, you may. So if you take a look at um, <coughs> The first page, what's the title of this article? Uh, a randomized crossover trial of transdermal fentanyl and sustained release oral morphine for treating chronic non-cancer pain. So again, we're talking about transdermal fentanyl patches? Yes, correct. Uh, with respect to uh, efficacy in treating chronic non-cancer pain? Yes. Uh, where was this study published? This was in the uh, British Medical Journal. What year was it published? Uh, 2001. Who are the authors? So it's uh, Lori Allen and colleagues. So if we could pull the slide back up, Ms. Conway. So what type of study was the Allen study? This is a randomized open-label crossover clinical trial. So what is a randomized open-label crossover clinical trial? So this one's a little more complicated. So rather than just having a single arm where everybody's getting the same thing, you have a case in which half the participants are randomized to the patch and half are randomized to the other condition. And in this case, it was the, the oral opioid. And then there's a crossover that occurs, and then they are exposed to the opposite condition. There's strength in that design in which uh, each individual serves as his own comparator. And it's also known as a within subjects study design. And here, what was the comparator? 
So it was the oral morphine. So how, uh, how long was this study for? It was two 28-day periods. I, for simplification, I put two months. And so basically there's a crossover after one month or after 28 days right. where those who were doing the patch go to the oral morphine and vice versa? That's correct. And how many patients were involved in this study? 256. And what were the conclusions of the Allen study? And if chance we could uh, pull up page one. So one of the primary conclusions was that the transdermal patch was preferred uh, over the oral opioid. And did they report as to the main reason why the fentanyl patch was preferred? Yeah, it was basically because the uh, amount of pain relief that was provided by the medication. And is that what's stated in the conclusion if we're looking down at the bottom of the first column on the first page? Uh, it is. And then going over to the top? Yeah. It's actually on the on top of the second column. Right. So, conclusion. The main reason for the preference was better pain relief, achieved with less constipation, and an enhanced quality of life. And the preference was for the patch over the oral morphine. That's correct. Okay. So let's uh, look at one other study, and if I might approach your honor. Yes. marked as uh, State's Exhibit 2521, uh, which I believe has been admitted. May we publish it? Yes, you may. Are you familiar with this article? I am. Is this also one of the articles that you used for purposes of arriving at your expert opinions in this case? I did. And is this, again, the type of article that experts in your field would rely upon for that purpose? Yes, absolutely. And what's the title of this article? Evaluation of long-term efficacy and safety of transdermal fentanyl in the treatment of chronic non-cancer pain. So again, this is looking at efficacy and safety, right? That's right. Of the transdermal fentanyl patch? Yes. For treatment of chronic non-cancer pain? Yes. Got it. And who are the authors? So it's uh, Keith Milligan and colleagues. And we had some testimony during the trial on this particular article, and you saw that reference in some of the testimony you reviewed? Yes. So um, in what publication was this study published? This is the Journal of Pain. And in what year was it published? In 2001. So if we could go ahead and pull up this exhibit, or the slide, I'm sorry. And, and so the first three we've looked at, Simpson, Television, and Allen, those were all peer reviewed, right? That's correct. And was Milligan peer reviewed? As yes, well? absolutely. What type of study was it? So it's an open label clinical trial. For what duration? Uh, this one goes out to 12 months. Longer period than these others, correct? Yes. And how many patients? 532. And what were the conclusions of the authors of the Milligan study? Basically, that uh, the transdermal uh, fentany, uh, fentanyl was effective in treating uh, chronic non-cancer pain. So look at page four, if we could go back to exhibit S2521. And down at the bottom is the conclusion stated under the heading global efficacy. Yes. And how did they state or report on their conclusion? So the author stated that the reported global efficacy of transdermal fentanyl was stable at 42% during the 12 month period and that the global efficacy rating of good or very good was given by 43% of patients at month three, 40% of patients at month six, 47% of patients at month nine, and 43% patients at 43 of patients at month 12. Maybe you can interpret that a little bit for us. What is that saying? Well, basically, that the, the effects produced by transdermal fentanyl was stable across the entire year uh, that the patients were being uh, treated with, with it. And the rating of good or very good? It sounds um, like it's important. That it's working. Yeah, it's working. Let me have you take a look at page six of exhibit S2521. 
and you'll see in the discussion the authors state that as the first long-term prospective trial of opioid analgesia in the management of chronic non-cancer pain, the study supports previous reports from retrospective trials and surveys that long-term opioid treatment of moderate to severe chronic pain is effective and well tolerated. Do you see that? I do. And then if you go over to page seven, down at the, starting at the bottom of the left column, the authors report opioid withdrawal symptoms. What are we talking about there? You know, individuals who start to experience symptoms of withdrawal as, as a function of not having a sufficient number of amount of opioids on board. Uh, were only reported in 3% of patients, suggesting that prolonged treatment is not associated with increased risk of withdrawal syndromes. Then they go on to state there were no reports of addictive behavior in any of the patients during this long-term study. Do you attach any significance to that? Quite a bit. Among other uh, testimony that you reviewed in this case, did you review the trial testimony of Dr. Muchmore? I did. And did you see where Dr. Muchmore was asked whether if you put a patient on opioid long enough, he or she would have a 100% chance of getting addicted? I did. And did you see that Dr. Muchmore answered that question that if the dose was significant enough to treat moderate to severe pain, yes. Did you see that? Yeah, I remember uh, reading it. You noticed that? Uh, yeah, I did. Do you think on that whether Dr. Muchmore had it right? Uh, unfortunately not. Why do you say that? And, uh, the data from this particular study uh, did, uh, are not in agreement with his remark. It's clear that you can treat patients for a long period of time, up to 12 months, and you have no uh, instances of addiction that are being reported. And are there other studies that are consistent with that as well? Yes. So let's pull back the slide if we might. So having looked at these studies and the work that you've done, um, what does the scientific evidence tell us about the efficacy of treatment of chronic non-cancer pain with a transdermal fentanyl patch like Duragesia? Basically that it works. I think there's compelling evidence that was presented by each of the investigators at each of the sites. Uh, and there are different uh, durations and different sizes of populations that are being used. So I, I think it clearly shows that uh, duragesic does work for uh, treating non-chronic, non-cancer pain. So let's just go back to our uh, chart of the hierarchy of scientific evidence we looked at earlier. And can we place these studies we just looked at in this hierarchy? Sure. And I, th I think we have a slide for that, if we could bring that up, Your Honor. Yes, you may. So where do these studies, Simpson, Allen, Delamesian, and Milligan, fall within this hierarchy of scientific evidence. So they, they were all randomized controlled trials. So at the top of the chart. That's correct. Now I want to ask you something. There's been evidence in this case about a letter that the FDA sent to Janssen in 2004 that has been referred to as a warning letter regarding a file card for Duragesic. Are yes. you familiar with that? I am. And did you review that letter? Uh, in connection with the work you've done in uh, arriving at your opinions in this matter. I did. And did you see in that letter from the FDA, they actually discuss three of the studies that we've just gone over here, Simpson, Allen, and Milligan? That is correct. Okay. And you saw that the FDA uh, uh, took issue with certain marketing statements that uh, Janssen had made citing as support these three studies? That's right. Okay, does any of that give you concern about the validity of these studies or whether you might reasonably rely on these studies as scientific evidence with respect to efficacy of a fentanyl patch for the treatment of uh, chronic non-cancer pain? I do not. Why not? 
Well, basically, you know, the letter came from the director of marketing uh, from uh, within the FDA. It wasn't coming from uh, other aspects of the FDA that would be related specifically to the safety or the efficacy of the compound. Uh, it has had everything to do with uh, the, the verbiage that was being used uh, and uh, the way that it was being advertised. I'm not an expert in, in, in that regard, and I don't have in opinions marketing. in marketing, yeah. So uh, it does not give me any pause whatsoever in terms of whether or not the, the findings that are, are in those reports are, are worthwhile or useful. And are you, uh, is there something called DDMAC? Yeah, well, that's one of the divisions. And do you know what that stands for? I don't specifically recall what it is, but it has to do with marketing and, you know, something else. And, and are there other divisions or departments within the FDA that if you were dealing with safety and efficacy issues, that's who you'd be hearing from? Yes, because, you know, I, I've submitted a lot of IND applications to the FDA, and, and these go to a very different uh, division and, and director. And it's the Center for the Evaluation of, of, of Drug Responses and Treatment, so CEDAR. And so if, if you get a letter from that branch of the FDA, uh, there's some serious problems that need to be addressed with your study design, with the compounds you're evaluating. And, and that's, that's when I would take notice. Okay, did you see any evidence in what you've reviewed that CEDAR, the Center for Drug Evaluation and Research, ever uh, uh, raised issues with Janssen about the safety or efficacy of their adjusic. I've never seen such a letter. And are you aware that both before and after this 19, this 2004 FDA letter, Duragesic was indicated for management of chronic pain in patients requiring continuous opioid therapy both before and after this letter? Yes. So let's turn to Nucenta ER. And again, we're still sort of referencing uh, Dr. Mal Deuce testimony that there's no evidence uh, showing efficacy here. And is there scientific literature that deals with this issue with respect to Nucenta ER? Yes, absolutely. Okay, may I approach your honor? Yes, you may. So I've handed you uh, what we've marked as 3946, J3946, uh, an, an article. Are you familiar with this article? I am. And uh, is it an article that you reviewed for purposes of arriving at your opinions in this matter? I did. And is this article the type of material that experts in your field would rely upon in arriving at such opinions? Yes, absolutely. Your Honor, I'd move exhibit J3946 into evidence. J3946 will be admitted into the evidence. Thank you, Your Honor. Will publish? Yes, you may. Um, what's the title of this article, Dr. Dilagarza? So it's a Tepentadol Prolonged Release for Chronic Pain, a Review of Clinical Trials and Five Years of Routine Clinical Practice Data. Tepentadol, do you understand that to be the active pharmaceutical ingredient in Nucenta ER? Yes. Who are the authors of this study? So it's Ralph Barron and colleagues. What publication was this study published? So it's the uh, journal Pain Practice. And what year was it published? Uh, this particular article was published in 2016. And was this article peer-reviewed? Yes, it was. So. Uh, what type of study was it? This is a systematic uh, review because it contains outcomes from several different studies that had been conducted. So one of the uh, systematic reviews, the technique that we had on the left of our hierarchy chart that can be applied to different types of studies? That's correct. And what types of studies were being looked at by these authors as part of their systematic review? For the most part, the studies that they uh, included in this review were randomized controlled trials. So top of the chart. Top of the chart. And having it be a systematic review just gives it additional scientific weight. It does. So are there, if you look at table one, 
that I believe is on page four. Does that table then list the various uh, studies and articles that were part of the systematic review? It does. And for the issue that we're talking about, the efficacy of the pentadol and the to ER for the treatment of chronic non-cancer pain, are there particular studies here that you believe are worth bringing to the court's attention? I can point out at least two or three of these. Okay. What's the first one then that we should take a look at? So the, the third one that's on uh, table one uh, by Buinek and colleagues. And I see there there's a reference to a footnote 15. That's correct. And if we could turn to footnote 15, Ms. Conway. And that's a description of this Buinek study? That's right. So uh, what was the title of that? Uh, Efficacy and Safety of Tepentadol Extended Release for the management of chronic low back pain, results of a prospective randomized double blind placebo and active control phase three study. So the random, the prospective randomized double blind placebo, that's top of the chart. Right? Ab absolute top of the chart. It doesn't get any better, right? No, it doesn't. Okay. And uh, what publication was this published in? In the Expert Opinions of Pharmacotherapy. In what year? So that was in 2010. So, um, did you go back and review this article? I did. We could bring up our slide, Ms. Conway. So we're now looking at Nucenta ER, or Tepentadol, and you explained that this was a randomized, double-blind, placebo, and active control clinical trial. What was the duration? So the dur duration was 12 weeks. How many patients were involved in this study? 965. Was this peer reviewed? Yes. Was a, you know, it talks about a placebo, but I thought I saw a reference to a comparator as well. There is one. H how was it that there was both a placebo and a comparator? It's just basically another arm uh, of the study that you enroll patients into. What was the comparator here? It was oxycodone. And how was that used? So it was an oral formulation uh, for oxycodone. So they were both comparing the Nucenta ER to, to pentadol against the placebo and then against the uh, oxycodone. The oxycodone. Okay. So what were the results of the Buniat study? So uh, basically they showed a, a significant reduction in pain um, produced by uh, the uh, to pentadol. And is that reported in table one? It is. We could pull that up, Ms. Conway. And that's the column reporting on efficacy? That's correct. And what do they report there? So if you uh, can highlight this area where it starts with baseline pain intensity and go to the second uh, part where it says significant reduction in pain uh, intensity at week 12 uh, as compared to placebo. And th these uh, effects are essentially statistically significant. That's what the P value means, P less than 0 0.001. Okay, thank you. So, still looking at table one then, is there a second article that you believe relevant to this issue? Yes, the, uh, the next article that's on the list uh, by Wild and colleagues. And that refers to a footnote 14, correct? Yes. And if we could turn then to footnote 14. And that's a uh, reference to the WILD study? That's right. And was the um, Buniak study peer reviewed then? Oh, yes. And was the WILD study peer reviewed? Yes. And what was the title of the WILD article? It's a long-term safety and tolerability of tepentadol extended release for the management of chronic low back pain or osteoarthritis pain. And who are the authors? It's uh, WILD and okay. colleagues. Is that the way? People in your field refer to things as the first name of the author at all? Uh, it is, unfortunately. How, how do you get to be the first name on these articles? It's usually the person who's, who's spent the most time doing the, the actual research uh, and then is, is the person who's doing the most work in terms of writing up the manuscript itself. So 
there's some fairness and equity to this? Uh, there is. Okay. Um, law firms are getting like that too, where there's, it's important to be the first name if you can be the first name. Yep. I think you've had art articles where you've been the first name. Yes. Many. Quite a few. Okay. So uh, where was this published? This was in the, uh, the journal Pain Practice. And what year was it published? It was in 2010. So if we could bring up our slide again. And you reviewed this, right? I did. So uh, what type of study was it? It was an, a randomized, open-label, uh, active controlled clinical trial. And we talked about randomized, we talked about open label. I'm not sure we specifically focused on active control. What does that mean? Well, uh, it's essentially the active comparator. So uh, you have, again, a comparator arm. It's an active medication that produces a known effect. And what was the comparator here? It was also oxycodone. How long was the study in this case? Yeah, in this case it was 12 months, so a, a full year. How many patients were involved? Uh, 1,117. And you mentioned that this was also peer-reviewed? Yes. So what were the results of the WILD study? So uh, similar to the one before, there, there's a reduction of pain intensity that occurred uh, from baseline into pentadol. And if we go back to table one and the column on efficacy, is that where in this table the results of the WILD study are reported? Yes. How did the uh, how are the results reported there? They're uh, they're shown uh, at the far right here, uh, in, in which you see uh, uh, changes from baseline for tapentadol from 7.6 to 4.4, and then you see similar sort of results uh, for the oxycodone 7.6 to about 4.5, uh, and those were greater than those that were found with placebo. So what does that mean? Well, there's significant uh, re uh, relief of pain in these individuals that are being treated with. Uh, both forms of, of medication. So is there uh, yet another article that would be relevant to the issue that we're talking about? We could go through one more and, and it's the following one which is Schwartz and colleagues. And that references uh, footnote 16, correct? Yes. We could turn to footnote 16. And does that describe the Schwartz article? It does. And the title of it? So, uh, this one is uh, safety and efficacy of tapentadol ER in patients with painful diabetic peripheral neuropathy. Results of a randomized withdrawal placebo-controlled trial. Who are the authors? It's Schwartz and colleagues. And uh, what publication is this published in? It's uh, Current Medical Research Opinions. In what year? So that was 2011. If we could pull up the slide again, Ms. Conway. So what type of study was the Schwartz study? It's a randomized withdrawal, double-blind, placebo-controlled trial. So again, top of the chart? It is. What was the duration of this study? This was 12 weeks. How many patients were involved? 389. And what were the results that were, was this peer reviewed? Too? Yes, it was. And did you review this as part of the work you've done, in this case, as an expert? I have. So, uh, so here the comparator was a, a placebo, right? Yes. Okay. And what were the results that were reported for this study? So significant reductions in pain intensity as compared to placebo. And is that reported in table one in the efficacy column? It is. We can turn to that. And that might require a little bit of translation, if you would. Yeah, so they, they uh, reported general uh, reductions in pain intensity, but they also broke it down by the amount uh, of reduction. <clears throat> so if you look at the, the far right, you see greater than or equal to 30%. Well, you see that uh, the reduction was 53.6% for tapentadol versus 42.2% for placebo. And that's statistically significant, that difference. Uh, greater than or equal than 50%, it was 37.8% for tapentadol versus 27.6% for placebo, and that's also statistically significant. Yeah, the result being it's showing that the uh, patients who were taking the, the pentadol were obtaining uh, pain relief. Yes. Uh, 
Well, a lot of this go by by saying a word that he's, he's been on the test line and he was clear. I'll sustain the objection. So um, let's look back at the hierarchy of scientific evidence and see where we would put these particular studies. We can pull up that slide. So where do the Wild, Luniac, and Schwartz studies fall within this hierarchy? So they were all randomized controlled trials, so they, they would be at the top of the, of the, of the group. So reviewing these particular studies, what does the scientific e evidence tell us about the efficacy of treatment of chronic non-cancer pain with Nucenta ER? The data that, that we've presented actually show that their Nucenta ER is effective uh, as a treatment for pain uh, in, uh, in these individuals. So based on these studies and what you've reviewed, can you say to a reasonable degree of scientific certainty whether duragesic and Nucenta ER are effective for the treatment of chronic non-cancer pain. The data, the data that we reviewed do show that. Uh, and can you uh, say to a reasonable degree of scientific certainty whether they are effective in that regard over the long term? Certainly, because there was you know, a difference from all the way from 12 weeks to 12 months. And so I think we can say that with some, with some confidence, yes. So if we could pull back up Dr. Maslum Deuce testimony that we started out with. And in particular, his statement there's never, there's really never been any evidence demonstrating efficacy of long acting opioids for long term pain. Uh, would you agree with him if we're talking about duragesic? I would not. And would you agree with him if we're talking about Nucenta ER? I would not. Okay, I want to turn to a different subject then, which are uh, rates of addiction or rates of uh, use disorder, and in particular with respect to opioids. Right. And as part of the work that you've done uh, as an expert in this case, did you review testimony of witnesses who addressed that issue? I have. And among others, did you review the testimony of Dr. Kalotny? I did. And did you read his testimony where he was uh, telling the court that it was widely accepted by the scientific and medical community that the prevalence of opioid use disorder in patients who are on opioids long term is one in four or 25 percent? I remember reading that, yes. Do you agree? with Dr. Kolodny's statement in that regard? I certainly do not. Um, now, just as a, a predicate, in going through your qualifications, you had described the work you do in assessing whether or not uh, a patient or a subject has uh, opioid dependence or an opioid use disorder, correct? That is correct. And since the adoption of DSM-5, that's been done under DSM-5 criteria? Yes. Did you, um, if we could bring up uh, page three of exhibit J338, which is in evidence, and will we publish that? Here? Yes, you may. Thank you. So just to get the terminology correct, under DSM-5, what you're diagnosing is an opioid use disorder, right? That is correct. And prior to DSM-5, under DSM-4, what was the diagnosis called? Basically opioid dependence. Uh, some, some people refer to it as opioid addiction. And did you read the, the trial testimony of Dr. Fong in this case? I did. And did you review his testimony where uh, he was discussing studies that had been cited by the CDC in support of a statement it had made about as many as one in four. That's correct, yes, I did. And did you review those studies as well? I did. And those were the Fleming, Bantha Green, and Boscarino studies? That's correct. Okay, if we could uh, bring up our hierarchy, how would you place those in the hierarchy of scientific evidence that we've been talking about? So they were a little bit lower on the, on the hierarchy. Uh, the Bosco Reno pa uh, paper was a cross-sectional study, so it would be in the middle. The Bantagreen and the Fleming articles are above that. 
uh, because they're basically cohort studies. Okay, so none of them were uh, randomized controlled trials? That's right. And did any of them involve a systematic review? No. Or a meta-analysis? Not, not that I recall, no. So if we could bring up the next slide. Uh, Dr. Fong explained how these were incidents, or were not incidence studies, they were prevalence studies. So the rates dealt with prevalence, not incidence. Do you agree with that? Yes. Is that important in terms of trying to determine a rate of opioid use disorder or opioid dependence? Yes, absolutely. The, the two terms are very different. Incidence uh, implies new cases, uh, something that's new and it's occurring for the first time. And so if that arises, that's important to note. Uh, prevalence uh, implies that something that's been around already, it's established uh, and it's recognized as, as a disease state that uh, is occurring in the individual. And did you prepare a slide to help explain those different concepts? I did. May we publish that, Your Honor? Yes, you may. So what are we looking at here, Dr. Gillagarza? Well, basically, uh, you see water droplets that are passing by. Uh, some of the water droplets fall into the beaker, and so that is incidence. Those are new cases. And so at any given time point, if you were to look there, that would be the incidence rate. That's new. You see that uh, the, the amount of water that's in the beaker, that's the prevalence. That's already uh, established. It's already known uh, for a population. But you see that the majority of the population is not being affected, and so they're just passing by the beaker. So why, when you're looking at a rate of a use disorder, a rate of dependence, are you looking at incidence rather than prevalence? Well, incidence is important because that's, if you're trying to assign uh, some value to the statement that it, it ero arose as a, a function of the treatment, uh, then you would want to see new cases. What are the new cases that have arisen? And that would only occur for, for incidence. If someone already has a diagnosis, that would be under the, the, the premise of prevalence. And so that would not provide new information. Can prevalence provide information of value? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, knowing who has that specific condition is, is important. And so knowing, knowing who is in that particular beaker already is important because those are the people who need treatment and, and should be provided treatment. It's well established. If it doesn't really tell you the rate of a use disorder or dependence. No, it doesn't. So I want to pull up again, Dr., or if I might, Your Honor, if I could pull up Dr. Claudi's testimony that we were talking about. Yes. Thank you. So I want to look first at the question that Dr. Kaladny was asked. And he was asked by uh, Mr. Beckworth, and you, you, you've also used the term several times that some studies or some folks will remark that the rate of addiction iatrogenic addiction or substitutes, and I think we meant substance abuse, or substance use disorder, using prescription opioids is as high as high as one in 24, 25%, probably meant to say one in four, um, correct? Uh, that seems to be the question that was asked. Yeah, so if you're, if you're trying to determine uh, a rate of addiction or a rate of iatrogenic addiction, I think you've already said this, would you be looking at incidence rates or prevalence rates? Incidence. Okay, so if you look then at Dr. Kaladi's answer, he starts out, yes, one in 24, 25%. That statistic comes from the studies of prevalence of opioid use disorder in patients who are uh, on opioids long term. You see that? Yes, I do. Can you make any sense as to why Dr. Kaladi is being asked about a rate of addiction and then talking about prevalence? I, I think it's a misstatement on his part. He, he may have misunderstood the question. Then he goes on saying, uh, but yes, the 25%, one in four, is widely accepted by the scientific and medical community. Do you see that? I do. Do you agree with his statement in that regard? I certainly do not. Okay, so I'd like to go over with you what the scientific literature actually shows. Yes. As part of your work in this case, have you reviewed studies and articles that relate to this particular issue? I did. And one of them, the Fishbane article. That is correct. 
Uh, if I may approach her, Honor. Yes, you may. what's been marked as <coughs> Exhibit J646, which I believe is in evidence. So may we publish your honor? Yes. Is this one of the articles that you reviewed uh, in arriving at your expert opinions in this case? It is. And is this the type of article that experts in your field would rely upon in reaching such opinions? Yes. What's the title of this article? What percentage of chronic non-malignant pain patients exposed to chronic opioid analgesic therapy develop abuse slash addiction and or aberrant drug-related behaviors? A structured evidence-based review. So I'm not sure we, we've seen that terminology. What is a structured evidence-based review? It's basically a systematic review. It's another word for it. And who are the authors? It's uh, David Fishbane and colleagues. What publication? Uh, pain Medicine. And what year was this published? In 2008. So if we can go back to our hierarchy chart. So you, this is a um, structured evidence-based review, which you said is the same as a systematic review? That's correct. Um, is this, uh, or was this study a meta-analysis? It wasn't a meta-analysis. That's a different sort of, of, of study that could be done at this level. Now, you've read Dr. Fong's testimony, correct? I have. Did you see where he mentioned this as being a meta-analysis? I did. Um, do you agree that this is a meta-analysis? Uh, I don't. Is there a reason why someone might confuse a systematic review with a meta-analysis? They're, they're largely similar. I mean, you're reviewing the available data and the available evidence. In a systematic review, you're generally using descriptors like percentages and means. In a meta-analysis, you use uh, a very different sort of uh, statistic that allows you a much more quantifiable number. Um, so they're, they're easy to confuse. Okay. But this is a systematic review, right? This is a systematic review. So that technique was applied? That's correct. And it was applied to what types of studies? So in, in this case, they were reviewing several different types of studies, and they cut across uh, the spectrum of those that are shown there. Now, um, I want to ask you, there's been testimony in this case about uh, Porter and Jim. Are you yes. familiar with that? Yes. And is there a reference in this uh, Fishbane article to Porter and Jeff. There is. And can you find that? Do you know what page it's on? It's on the page 446 of this particular article. I guess I should be referring to page 3 of this exhibit. So J646.0003. Right. And where is it on that page? So it's on this right hand column uh, towards the bottom. And you see the reference to Porter and Jake, which is number 13. Oh, there it is. Yeah, so th they essentially laid out what the, the specific criteria were in, in order for studies to be included uh, in this uh, review. And they said uh, studies not providing such information were excluded. For example, Porter and Jick. So Porter and Jick was not included in this analysis. Was not included. That's correct. Um, I want to refer you then, again, you, you saw Dr. Fong's testimony. I did. And did you see when you read his testimony that he was asked by Mr. Beckworth whether the Fishbane article actually relied on Porter and Jack? I remember seeing that, yes. And Your Honor, may we bring that up? Yes, you may. It's the July 1, 2019 afternoon transcript at page 107, lines 14 to 16. And so following question was asked by Mr. Beckworth, are you familiar with that Fishbane actually relied upon something called Porter and Jack? And Dr. Fong's answer was, no, I'm not. But Mr. Beckworth had it wrong, right? Well, he may have seen the reference there, and that may have been the reason why he 
he thought that, but that's not correct. But they did not rely on it, right? Uh, they purposely excluded it. Mr. Whitten. That just characterizes the evidence. It does sign for a I overrule the objection. Thank you. So um, I want to look at Porter and Jet because there's been a lot of talk about it, and I think it might be useful to really explain what it is. Okay. Um, so what was Porter and Jet? So Porter and Jet was a, a letter to the editor, a letter to the editor in the New England Journal of Medicine, and in, in their particular case, they were trying to bring to the attention of, of that journal and its readership uh, findings that they had published previously. Um, so a lot of people, if, if we were to think about the hierarchy that I had shown earlier, if you have an editorial or a letter to the editor, that's generally at the lowest level of the hierarchy of scientific evidence. But in, in their particular case, if you look at uh, the, the first and the primary study that they reference, it's a study by Dr. Jick himself. And that study uh, was published in the Journal of the American Medical Association. And that's one of the top tier journals in the country. And it was a review of over 11,000 patients. So the letter to the editor was merely a way for him to bring some attention to his already published findings in one of the top tier journals uh, in the nation. So. so the letter itself was referencing and bringing attention to another published study. A peer reviewed article. Okay. And your honor, the, the Porter and Jick um, letter is States Exhibit 901, which is in evidence. May we publish that? Yes. Thank you. We could bring that up. And if we could just blow that up in the top left hand column. So it's a short letter, correct? Yep. But you say it's actually referring to a published study? That's correct. And what's the, the reference to that study? It's, it's, the, it's hard to read here, but it's right after this statement uh, of 39,946 hospitalized medical patients, and then there's a, a, a one in the superscript. That one in superscript then is the reference that is shown there, Jick and colleagues, and JAMA is a journal. This is the Journal of the American Medical Association. So is this a JAMA article? that was published in uh, 1970 and authored by Jack et al., a peer-reviewed article? Yes, it was. So I want to bring up the slide. We've been talking about the Fishbane article, and if we can go back, and we have another slide with the course permission that we use in going through these, Your Honor? Yes. So we talked about Fishbane, and what year was it? So it was 2008. And uh, what type of study was it, or what was the population? So it was a systematic review, and it was several different types of studies that were in involved or included in this review. Uh, so there are 24 studies, and there were 2,507 patients. And this was an incidence review? Yes, it was an incidence study. And it was peer reviewed? Yes. And what were the conclusions from this study? Basically that the, the rate uh, of addiction was quite low. It was 3.27 percent. That's one of the main conclusions. But they go further uh, and they say that in individuals with uh, no chronic history or history of substance use disorder, that rate was as low as 0.19 percent. So to be clear then, what was the difference between the 0.19 percent rate and the 3.27 percent rate according to the Fishbane study? Uh, it's really just a matter of a uh, 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 history of substance use disorder versus no history of substance use disorder. So is that another way to say that, higher risk factors? Certainly. In the one group rather than the other? Right. And where, is, where are these results reported in the Fishbane article? Is that part of the abstract? Well, you can find it in the abstract, and you can certainly find it in, in the results section of the manuscript. If we could pull up page one. And where is it reported in the abstract? Uh, so if, if you uh, move down to the results section, basically in the first sentence. So uh, I'll read, uh, for the abuse addiction grouping, there were 24 studies with 2,500 chronic pain patients exposed. That's what CPPs mean? That's correct. Uh, for a calculated abuse addiction rate of 3.27%. 327 
And does it also explain the lower 0.19? Yes, so then, you know, within that grouping of, of studies that had, had pre-selected chronic pain patient uh, for the uh, chronic opioid exposure treatment, but for no previous or current history of abuse or addiction, the percentage was then 0.19 percent. Did the authors of this study also uh, offer uh, an ultimate or bottom line conclusion? Yeah, basically, that there, the uh, rates of addiction are quite low uh, in individuals who are exposed to opioids. So take a look at page 12. So how did they report on their ultimate conclusion? So in, in their words, the results of this uh, evidence-based structured review indicate that opioid exposure will lead to abuse or addiction in a very small percentage of patients. Uh, and that that percentage can be dramatically reduced by pre-selecting uh, individuals for no previous or current history of drug, alcohol, abuse, or addiction. Again, talking about risk factors. That's correct. So is there another uh, article that you reviewed as part of your work on this particular issue? Yes, there is. Um, I may approach you Yes, you may. you what's been marked as Exhibit J400. Uh, are you familiar with this document? Yes, I am. And is this an article that you reviewed in connection with the work you've done as an expert in this case? Yes, I did. And is this uh, an article that you've relied on in reaching your opinions on this issue? I did. And is this the type of material that experts in your field would typically rely upon in arriving at such opinions? Yes, absolutely. Um, and, Your Honor, this uh, is Exhibit J400, which I believe has been admitted. It's been talked about before. It's the Noble article that's in the Cochrane Library. So may I publish? Yes, you may. So what is the title of this article? It's a Long-Term Opioid Management for Chronic Non-Cancer Pain, a review. Who are the authors? It's uh, Noble and colleagues. And where was this published? So this is uh, published in the Cochrane Database of Systematic Reviews. And what is the Cochrane Database of Systematic Reviews? So it's basically the highest level of publishing that occurs for meta-analyses. Uh, Cochrane Reviews tend to be uh, the best uh, reports uh, that involve uh, trying to put data together from s several different studies. What year was this published? In uh, 2010. And if we could bring the slide up, Ms. Conway. So uh, what was the population that was studied in this review? So these were also chronic pain patients. There were 4,893 of them. And it encompasses uh, 26 different studies. And so this was not only a meta-analysis, but also a systematic review, which means they're going to provide all forms of data uh, to us in, in order to try to understand what's there. And what types of studies were being uh, systematically reviewed and subject to the meta-analysis? So if we look back at the hierarchy of evidence, it's basically the top three levels. So the randomized controlled trials, the cohort studies, and the cross-sectional studies. And was this uh, systematic review looking at rates of incidence? Uh, they were looking at incidence, that's correct. And was it peer reviewed? It was. And what were the results then of this study? Basically that the rate uh, of addiction that was observed was 0.27%. And if you look at the uh, abstract, on page three, does that then report on the results? Yes, it does. And where is that? We could pull up exhibit J400. It's on the next page. So you're on page four now? Yeah. Perhaps it's not.
Yeah, so it is on that page. So at the top it says signs of opioid addiction were reported in 0.27% of participants in the studies that reported that outcome. Now, I want to ask you about some of the limitations of this study. I know we've talked about limitations generally and we looked at it uh, a bit with one of the studies, but take a look at page, same page, page four, and there's something called a plain language summary, uh, which starts out, opioids for long-term treatment of non-cancer pain, and it reads, the findings of this systematic review suggest that proper management of a type of strong painkiller, and then it says parenthetically opioids, in well-selected patients with no history of substance addiction or abuse. Can, and was that really the uh, population they were looking at here? Yes. Uh, so low risk factors. That's right. Can lead to long-term pain relief for some patients with a very small, and then it says parenthetically, though not zero, risk of developing addiction, abuse, or other serious side effects. And here's what I want to ask you about. However, the evidence supporting these conclusions is weak, and longer-term studies are needed to identify the patients who are most likely to benefit from treatment. Do you see that? I do. Okay, does that limitation or qualification raise uh, any question in your mind about the validity of the 0.27% uh, incidence rate that they found through this study? No, the data are the data. The, the data that they found uh, uh, reflect their calculations on the basis of the reports that they summarized. So how do you interpret what the authors are trying to say here? I think it, it's like any other sort of limitation section that an, uh, that an author includes in, in a peer-reviewed manuscript, and it's their way of saying that the data are not perfect, uh, and there are some limitations to it, and there are other things that we can do to better understand the problem. And in particular, they're talking about being able to identify patients who are most likely to benefit from the treatment, right? That's, that's correct. And that longer term studies, according to these authors, are needed to be able to do that type of identification. That's right. Um, did you review any other studies in connection with the rising of your opinions on this particular issue? I did. And Mr. Yoder, I, I think we might want to just cut here for That's break. That's fine, Your Honor. Okay. Uh, so let's go ahead and, and uh, take our lunch break. We'll resume again at 1.30. All right.